Welcome to Fanfiction Audiobook. Hogwarts. I am the Wizard of Goblins. Chapter 16. After the sorting ceremony, the Ravenclaw Eaglets welcomed Shane very warmly. It wasn't because of anything else, or because Shane dared to pull out his wand and cast a spell on the sorting hat during the sorting ceremony. For the Eagles, how Shane used such a powerful clean up a new Scourgeify is the key point. Because in fact, Shane is not the first person to use this spell on the sorting hat. In the past 200 years of Hogwarts, because the sorting hat only leaves the principal's office during the annual sorting ceremony, some daring little wizards will try to launch a cleaning plan for the sorting hat during this time, and often use methods just use the magic spell clean up a new Scourgeify. But the result is obvious. Because of the extremely stubborn patina on the sorting hat, the actions of these warriors failed without exception. The little eagles once heard the ghost say that the last time a similar incident happened was decades ago, and the person involved in that incident is now sitting on the professor's chair over there, and he can transform into a cat. At this time, Shane was sitting on Ravenclaw's long table, crazily stuffing things into his mouth. Cream cakes, fried chicken legs, steaks, lamb chops, fried fish, chips, apple pie, etc., you can eat whatever you want, and everyone around you is stunned. It's just that people are wondering, why doesn't Shane eat mashed potatoes? Faced with the strange looks from around him, Shane ignored them. He picked up a piece of fried pork chop that was still smelling fragrant and directly put a piece of cheese on it. Then he took out his wand and grilled it with fire burning incendio. The cheese melts and blends with the pork chops. Then, Shane picked up the homemade cheese fried pork chop and put it in his mouth. Yes, that's the smell. When the little badgers at Hufflepuff on the next table saw this scene, they all looked at the fried pork chops on their own tables and began to imitate it in a decent manner. As a result, after trying it, the little badger's eyes instantly lit up. Delicious. How come such a talent is not from our college? And while imitating it, the little badgers also replaced the fried pork chops with fried chicken legs, which was equally delicious. On the other side, Dumbledore, who was sitting on the professor's chair, was looking thoughtfully at Shane who was devouring his food. He was deeply impressed by this student. Not only because of the action of cleaning the sorting hat just now, but also because Professor McGonagall mentioned this name to him a month ago. Now it seems that Minerva is right, this student Shane Dolea is special, very special. After dinner, as usual, the prefect of each college will lead the first-year students to the lounge and dormitory of their college. The current senior at Ravenclaw is named Ivana Blanchard, and she is taking Shane and the others to Ravenclaw Tower. Hello everyone, my name is Ivana Blanchard, the prefect of Ravenclaw. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Ravenclaw Academy. Ivana said as she led the new students through the moving stairs. The emblem of our college is an eagle, and the representative colors are sky blue and bronze, which means soaring high to the unreachable peak. Our common room is located at the top of Ravenclaw Tower, hidden behind a door with a magic knocker. Through the arched windows of the circular common room, you can see the entire Hogwarts campus, the Black Lake and the Forbidden Forest, Quidditch Pitch and Greenhouse. Other houses are not lucky enough to enjoy this beauty. Ivana proudly introduced the various features and advantages of Ravenclaw Academy, and brought the young wizards to an old wooden door with a raven-shaped bronze door knocker inlaid on the door. I don't mean to be exaggerated, but Ravenclaw Academy is indeed a place where the smartest wizards live. As Rowena Ravenclaw, the founder of our academy, said, extraordinary intelligence is mankind's greatest wealth. We don't need to hide the entrance to the common room like other colleges do. Our common room door is at the top of a long, curved staircase and has no handle, just an enchanted raven-shaped bronze knocker. When you knock on the door, Crow Ring will ask you questions. You need to use your wisdom to answer the corresponding questions correctly to enter, but please remember that the answer is not the only one. But I can say that for nearly a millennium, no one but the Ravenclaw has been able to pass this simple barrier. So, now who wants to give it a try? Ivana turned around facing away from the raven-shaped door knocker and said. The freshmen looked at each other, and after a while, a Ravenclaw freshman volunteered to step forward. I'll come. Then he raised his hand and knocked the door knocker. The crow ring shook a few times and asked, what does the elephant's left ear look like? Forehead. 
This question confused the student because it was too subjective and there was no standard answer. At the same time, the little eagles who heard the question behind were also talking about it. Let me remind you that the answer is not the only one, and the answer only needs to be recognized by Crow Huan, so don't let yourself be imprisoned by your usual thinking. Ivana reminded at this time. The little eagles started to use their brains, but after several minutes and trying several answers, Crow Ring was not satisfied. At this time, Shane looked to his left, then to his left, and gradually became impatient. Because he didn't understand why these little eagles couldn't answer this question because it was pure nonsense literature. So in order to go back to the dormitory to take a shower and sleep early, Shane walked straight to the wooden door and said to the crow ring, the elephant's left ear is like the elephant's right ear. Correct. Without any delay, Crow Huan immediately opened the wooden door. It was then that the little eagles suddenly realized the answer. Well done, Dolia. Ivana praised, and then said to the other eagles, don't be discouraged. If you answer more questions in the future, you will naturally master the rules of the questions. Okay, come with me now. Ivana pushed open the wooden door, followed by the small eagle door and filed in. Shane glanced at the wooden door before entering the lounge and thought to himself, is this door made of wood? Then if I can't answer the question in the future, can I just break in? The wooden door was gradually closed, but for some reason, the bronze crow ring on the door suddenly shook inexplicably, as if it felt a deep malice coming towards it. Ravenclaw's common room is a large circular room with blue and bronze as the main colors. It is the best viewing location in the entire Hogwarts school. There are elegant arched windows on the wall, with blue and bronze silk curtains hanging in front of the windows. Students can usually lift the curtains and see the beautiful scenery outside through the windows. The ceiling of the lounge is designed as a dome, with stars and moons on it, and stars are also painted on the dark blue carpet on the floor, reflecting each other. At the same time, there are sofas, tables, chairs, lamps, etc. in the lounge. Some fresh fruits are placed on the round table. Directly opposite the entrance to the lounge is an alcove, which contains a half-length white marble statue of Rowena Ravenclaw, and behind the statue is a huge bookshelf with at least a thousand books on it. Next to the bookshelf is the door leading to entrance to the dormitory upstairs. This is Ravenclaw's common room, which we all call the home of wise men. There are a total of 1,126 books on the bookshelf behind. You can read as you like, but please note that these books are absolutely they cannot be taken out of the lounge, because these precious treasures belong exclusively to Ravenclaw's thousand-year collection. The ghost of our college is Ms. Gray. She is the daughter of the Eagle Ancestor. She is a very beautiful lady, but she seldom speaks, but she can talk to Ravenclaw. It is said that she has something to do with Slytherin's ghost bloody blur. Of course we have never she doesn't ask questions. She helps you when you're lost or can't find something. Then finally, I wish you have a wonderful night today. The entrance to our dormitory is next to the bookshelf. When you go up, you can see the four poster bed covered with a sky blue silk quilt, and the wind is blowing in front of the window. The sound makes people feel very comfortable, and of course, you can also enjoy the beautiful scenery and starry sky of Hogwarts through the windows. The above is Ravenclaw's welcome speech to the new students. Ivana has to say it once every year since she became the senior. After the breakup, Shane didn't stop in the lounge, but hurried upstairs. The entrance to the dormitory was a mirror, which dazzled Shane. It took him a while to find his own bed, and his luggage was already placed next to the four-leg bed. Seeing no one around, Shane opened his portable space and took out all the pillows, quilts and other bedding that had been prepared inside. He first changed the pillow and put a pillow towel on it, then replaced the soft silk quilt prepared by the school with his own quilt cover, then threw his big pillow on the bed, and finally took out the fairy tale guild badge to hang at the bedside. Done. Shane clapped his hands in satisfaction. The reason why he did this was not because he couldn't trust Hogwarts, but because he was deeply impressed by the sanitary conditions of the British wizarding community, whether in Diagon Alley or on the Hogwarts Express. Shane looked at the neat bed and snapped his fingers. Wandless casting clean up a new Scourgeify. No, as far as hygiene was concerned, he just didn't trust Hogwarts as well. After making the bed, Shane hurriedly went to the bathroom to take a shower and brush his teeth. When he came back, he threw himself on the bed. 
Shane is actually very tired, because building a relationship with Thinking Barrier has consumed too much of his energy, so at the end of the day, he just wants to have a good sleep. Regardless of thunder and lightning or earthquakes and fires, we will talk about big things tomorrow. But after a short sleep. Buzz, buzz, buzz. A burst of 3D stereo surround sound suddenly hit his ears, making Shane frown. Immediately afterwards, Shane felt the pain and itching on the soles of his feet exposed outside the quilt, causing his blood pressure to rise. How come there are mosquitoes in this weather? How come there are mosquitoes in this weather? Shane immediately lifted the quilt and complained angrily. If he had known better, he would have gone to the Chinese supermarket to buy a bed mosquito net and brought it over. Fortunately, he had anticipated this possibility before coming to Hogwarts. After all, the flower gardener's rabbit would think carefully when traveling far away. Shane reached into the void, took out the prepared mosquito coil and lit it. After a while, the entire Ravenclaw boys' dormitory was filled with a faint floral fragrance. This kind of mosquito coil is specially made by Shane, who would go to the supermarket to buy that kind of choking and unpleasant mosquito coil. After driving away the mosquitoes, Shane tucked himself into the quilt, hugged the big pillow, and began to drift off to sleep. It's finally quiet, oh, underscore, Oz. The moon was sparse, and over Hogwarts, the moon ran out of the thick clouds, finally showing its full glory. Under the ancient castle, the black lake sparkles. Under the silver light, some small nocturnal animals in the water are playing with each other in the reflection of the castle, seeming to wish everyone a good dream tonight. The next morning, the sun rose and the sun was shining brightly. It's the first day of school at Hogwarts. At this time, a harsh alarm sounded in Ravenclaw's dormitory, trying to wake up Shane who was still sleeping. Bulu, 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 click. Shane reflexively pressed the snail-shaped alarm clock on his bedside. At this time, his body was already awake, but his brain was not yet awake. This telephone bug-shaped alarm clock was specially made by Shane in Diagon Alley. Because Hogwarts cannot use any electronic devices, this alarm clock can only call people at regular intervals and cannot tell the time. After a while, Shane got up with difficulty. He stretched first, rubbed his eyes, and tried hard to dispel the lingering sleepiness in his mind. Then he relied on instinct and slowly climbed out of bed, sleepily went to the bathroom to wash up, and then wandered back to the room to change clothes. When they came to the cafeteria, many people saw a ruthless man who was sleeping and eating breakfast with his eyes closed. It wasn't until Shane stuffed a lump of white mud into his mouth that he really woke up. You, who gave me the mashed potatoes? A familiar smell rushed into his nose, and Shane's mind suddenly cleared. How come you can have mashed potatoes for breakfast even when you're not at home? Shane took a sip of milk to wash away the residual taste of mashed potatoes in his mouth and then looked around as if he was aware of it, and found that everyone in the cafeteria was looking at him strangely. Why are you looking at me if you don't have breakfast? Shane scratched his head. At this moment, a familiar figure ran over and sat down opposite Shane. Good morning, Shane. Good morning, Hermione. Shane responded, and then looked at the big book in Hermione's hand in confusion, which was at least as big as two of his faces, why are you holding such a big book, aren't you tired? Quote. It's okay, I just want to read more. Hermione replied, I plan to finish reading this book this week. I read it for more than an hour last night. Is this the case when school just starts? Shane's eyes twitched, and he couldn't help but start to persuade, Hermione, you can't study like this. You need to know how to combine work and rest when studying. Memorize by rote without understanding the content of the book. What's the use of reading more? Quote. But if I don't read more when I have free time, I won't be able to keep up with the others. Hermione replied stubbornly and a little aggrievedly. Upon hearing this sentence, Shane instantly understood what the little witch was thinking. Hermione might have thought that she was born into a muggle family, so she felt that compared to those children from wizarding families, her foundation would definitely lag far behind others. Hermione, do you think that parents of wizarding families start teaching their children magic from an early age? Isn't it? Hermione looked surprised. Isn't this a natural thing? Of course not. Shane sighed, knocked on the table and stood up. Let me ask you, do you know about squibs? 
You know, people whose parents are wizards but whose children can't use magic. Hermione nodded. That's right. Then do you know why there are squibs? If based on genetics alone, if both parents are wizards, squibs shouldn't exist, and you shouldn't be standing here. That's because if a person wants to become a wizard, blood inheritance is not the key, the key is magic riots. Whether they are children from a wizarding family or a muggle family, they must experience magic riots before they can be qualified to use magic. Shane and Hermione left the cafeteria, explaining as they walked. Does it make any difference? Hermione asked. In fact, there is no difference. The time when a person's magic riot occurs is uncertain, even in a wizarding family. Before the magic riot occurs, you cannot expect a child to learn writing without a pencil. Moreover, even if a child experiences magic riots at a very young age, his parents still will not teach his children to use magic. Why? Hermione asked curiously. Because children do not have mature enough thinking and will to control the power of magic. If an immature child uses magic, do you know what he will do? You must have seen some skinny children being bullied before but unable to fight back. Think about it carefully, what would happen if that child had magic? Power can control people, Hermione, you will learn this later. Shane said a lot, which are actually summaries of his previous experiences. In a slant, there are countless adult magicians who have fallen into darkness due to the power of magic, let alone children. In pursuit of power, you should do whatever it takes, destroy your humanity, and gradually lose yourself. Don't do this too much. Of course, magic cannot be taught, but theoretical things can still be taught. At this time, Shane added, potions does not require magic, but the subject itself is very complex and has very high requirements for learners. If you don't have a potions master who teaches you from an early age, you won't be able to learn it from an early age. So that's it. After Shane's words, the tension in Hermione's heart gradually began to relax. And before they knew it, the two of them walked to the classroom while chatting. Perhaps because they arrived a little early, there were only two or three little wizards in the classroom, but they all fell asleep in the same room, and only one of them was flipping through a book. But one thing that caught their attention was that there was a tabby cat with square glasses lines on its face looking at them on the classroom platform. Hermione is a cat lover, so when she saw this tabby cat, her cat addiction started unknowingly. When Shane saw Hermione walking up to the podium and trying to pet the cat, his scalp felt numb and he quickly ran over and grabbed her collar to pull her back. What are you doing? Hermione turned around and looked at Shane a little angrily. But Shane ignored her and just bowed slightly to the tabby cat. Good morning, Professor McGonagall. The tabby cat jumped from the podium and transformed back into its human form under Hermione's shocked gaze. Good morning, Mr. Dolea, Miss Granger. Professor McGonagall still looked serious as always. But faced with Professor McGonagall's greeting, Hermione was still dumbfounded and didn't respond, so Shane patted her head hard. Ah, oh, good morning, Professor McGonagall. Hermione finally came to her senses and responded quickly. My god. I almost masked RB Ted Professor McGonagall just now. Hermione's face was red now and she lowered her head in embarrassment. I'm curious, Mr. Dolea, how did you discover my identity? Professor McGonagall looked at Shane with questioning eyes. A first-year wizard should not be able to see the transformed animag. Sri Lanka. I still know that you are one of the animagus registered with the Ministry of Magic, and I have also seen your animagus photo in the magazine Transfiguration today. This is Shane's truth, otherwise there are so many cats in Hogwarts, who would know which one is Professor McGonagall. After hearing Shane's answer, Professor McGonagall nodded, but then said, Mr. Dolea, if you are here to send Miss Granger to the classroom, then you can go back to your classroom. I don't think your dean will. I hope someone will be late on the first day of school, especially Ravenclaw students. Huh, didn't I have transfiguration in my first class? That's right, I didn't seem to read the class schedule. Shane recalled now that he fell asleep directly last night and woke up in the cafeteria in the morning, so he had no idea what class he was going to attend today. He had just been taken to the transfiguration classroom by Hermione in a daze. Ha ha ha. Sorry, Professor McGonagall, do you know where my classroom is? Shane smiled awkwardly and asked. On the fourth floor, you'd better hurry up if you don't want to be late. 
Professor McGonagall shook his head angrily. Then I'll go first. Thank you, Professor McGonagall. And Hermione, we'll talk next time. After saying that, Shane turned and ran out of the Transfiguration classroom. Shane ran outside the classroom and saw that the stairs on each floor were changing randomly, so he thought for a moment, waved the wand in front of him, and flew up from the patio in the middle of the stairs. The students from the first floor to the fourth floor were stunned. Why take the stairs when you can fly? Still such troublesome stairs. Classmate, where is the charms classroom? Flying to the fourth floor, Shane patted a classmate on the shoulder and asked. However, the student did not speak, and just pointed in a direction blankly. Okay, thank you. Shane thanked him and walked towards the classroom. Little did he know that his behavior just now had caused an uproar among the students. That student seemed to have just flown up without using a broomstick. How did he do it? Did he use alchemy tools? He looks quite handsome. Which college is he a student from? Red hearts popped up in my eyes. The first spells lesson of the school year was with Hufflepuff's Little Badger. But for Shane, this grade course is simply tasteless and a pity to abandon. It's boring because the magic class currently teaches first-year knowledge, all of which are entry-level and mostly theory-based. For Shane, who has long since completed self-study, this is a waste of time. It's a pity because Professor Flitwick will impart some of his understanding of magic and spell-casting skills during the lecture, and this is something that Shane cannot miss because any minute details may be harmful to him. It helped that he speeded up the development and research of enchantments. For example, when Professor Flitwick taught the levitation curse Wingardium Leviosa, he asked the young wizards to pay attention to the movements of waving the wand. First wave, then shake, this is the standard spell-casting gesture of this magic. But just when Professor Flitwick asked the students in the class to try to practice, Shane suddenly raised his hand and asked, Professor, is this action fixed? Or can it be anything? Professor Flitwick was suddenly stunned when he heard this question. He didn't know why the little wizard would ask such a question, but he still gave a detailed answer. No, no, of course not. Professor Flitwick shook his head and said, However, Mr. Dolea, you asked a question that has never been asked by a student, at least when I was a professor at Hogwarts. With a slight lift of the wand in his hand, a book next to him flew up. The answer to this question is a bit long, but I can still tell you. In fact, the casting movements of any spell are not fixed. I once communicated with Miranda Gorshak's daughter. When her mother began to write, standard spells, she observed many young people. Wizards, just like all of us here. She found that when these young wizards began to learn levitation curse Wingardium Leviosa, they would habitually use the swipe and shake movement without any guidance. Of course, some people would be different, but the fact that's true. Later, after many researches, Ms. Gorshik found that each magic spell has a corresponding casting action, which can make it easier for young wizards who are new to magic to master and learn various magic spells. Therefore, based on this, Gorshik Ms. Shack compiled the spell casting actions for every commonly used spell, and finally wrote the Standard Spells series of books in 1921. Professor, if casting spells is just an auxiliary means for learning magic, then what is the key to learning a magic? Shane continued to ask. It's the heart, Mr. Dolea, it's the heart. Professor Flitwick scratched his chest with the hand holding the wand, and there was a ripple of memories in his eyes. You will find that magic is the key to every wizard. The reflection of the heart in reality, if a person has a kind heart, then she will be able to learn healing magic easily, but if his heart is evil, then he will often learn magic that hurts people. To be honest, Mr. Dolea, you really surprised me. No little wizard has ever thought about this. 10 points for Ravenclaw. In this way, while earning 10 college points for his college, Shane further confirmed his conjecture about the magic in the world of Harry Potter. Soon it was lunchtime. After class, Shane went back to Ravenclaw's common room and copied the class schedule posted on the wall using copy to double Geminio and then went to the auditorium to eat. At this time, his cheeks were bulging, he was holding a class schedule in one hand, and stuffing food into his mouth with homemade chopsticks. He didn't realize that there were many people around him looking at him with strange eyes. Look, it's him. He was the one who flew from the first floor to the fourth floor all at once this morning. He scared everyone silly. So powerful. 
Which college is he from? No, you don't know. He was the one who washed the sorting hat at the sorting ceremony yesterday. It turns out it's him. Shane Dolea, I remember he was assigned to Ravenclaw. Why do you think Dole can fly? Is he an Animagus? No, how can there be such a young Animagus? Maybe it's an alchemy tool. Don't you know there are innate Animagus? I doubt. Gradually, there were more and more rumors about Shane, and they became more and more crooked. Some people were chatting about him, and they all regarded him as that rare humanoid magical animal. But Shane didn't hear these words. He was constantly complaining about the curriculum set by Hogwarts in his mind. At Hogwarts, first-year students need to study a total of seven courses, astronomy, charms, defense against the dark arts, herbology, history of magic, potions, and transfiguration. According to the current curriculum, First-year students only have three classes at most and one class at least every day. From Monday to Friday, except for the potions class, which requires two consecutive classes, all other classes are 30 minutes each, averaging 1.2 class hours per day. The academic system of Hogwarts is two semesters per academic year. Calculated from the beginning of September to the end of the third week of June next year, the entire academic year of Hogwarts, excluding weekends and holidays, has about 170 students, class days. One academic year lasts for 10 months, with a total of 204 class hours, an average of 20.4 class hours per month. What do you use the rest of your time for? Surfing. This makes Shane, a person who has received the exam-oriented education of a flower grower, have red eyes. I remember that during the college entrance examination, he spent more than this amount of time studying in two days. Moreover, the first-year students are just laying foundations. What can they learn in such little time? No, the more I think about it, the angrier I get, and my heart gradually becomes a little unbalanced. And just as Shane continued to release the resentment remaining in his heart, suddenly two red-haired guys came to Shane quietly. Shane. The twin Weasleys suddenly appeared from behind Shane. We have all heard about you flying from the first floor to the fourth floor this morning. Fred said. Can you tell us how? George asked. Huh, why are you asking this? Shane had already noticed the arrival of the two of them, but when he heard their questions, a question mark still appeared on his head. We want revenge on Peeves. Fred and George said in unison. Peeves. Shane then remembered that there was indeed such a character in the original work, but it was not included when the movie was made, so he naturally forgot about it. Can you tell me in detail? Immediately afterwards, Fred and George began to tell the story of their battle of wits with Peeves throughout the last year. It turns out that Peeves is a famous mischievous troublemaker at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. He has existed since the beginning of Hogwarts. Except for Bloody Barrow and Albus Dumbledore, the entire Hogwarts no one can control him. Just last year, Fred and George were on their way back to the dormitory after the opening dinner. Peeves threw a trash can filled with various vegetable and fruit peels on top of the Gryffindor freshman team. Fred and George they suffered a big disaster on the spot, and from then on, the two of them formed an irresolvable hatred with Peeves. Peeves can fly and go through walls, so it's hard for us to catch him. Fred said. It would often fly screaming through the corridors of Hogwarts, doing all kinds of mischief. It would put a wastebasket on your head, pull the carpet out from under your feet, throw bits of chalk at you, or sneak up behind you and grab your nose when you can't see it. George said a little resentfully. So if you can teach us the magic of flying, we can figure out how to catch peeves. So that's it. Shane nodded to show that he understood, but he asked doubtfully, No, haven't you ever thought about using the levitating spell to fly before? Fred and George looked at each other and said in unison, Tried it. But although it can fly, its speed is nowhere near as fast as Peeves. Fred said. In using the levitating spell, we can't control our posture, and we will hit our heads against the wall. George said. What I use is the levitating spell. You can't do it because you haven't practiced enough. Maybe you can also try casting spells on each other. Shane explained. Also, I want to ask another question. Isn't Peeves very short? He has a broad face, a big mouth, and round eyes. He wears brightly colored clothes, a tie, and a hat. His slippers have long slits to expose his toes. Fred and George didn't speak, just nodded in agreement. It's right behind you, 
After hearing Shane's words, the Weasley twins turned their heads and looked behind them, only to see a little monster that exactly matched what Shane had just said, floating behind them. Peeves reached out and grabbed the Weasley twins' noses and pulled them back hard, shouting, hold your noses. Then he immediately flew away, causing many pranks on the way, such as leaving the table on the table. The cream cake is photographed in other people's faces. Ouch. Shet. Peeves. Stop right there. Many little wizards who were having lunch in the Great Hall suffered disaster. Fred and George both covered their noses and chased them out, vowing to take revenge again. When Shane saw the mess in the auditorium in front of him, he couldn't help but smile. But after a while, he seemed to suddenly think of something and suppressed his smile. It turns out that you have been trying to maintain the joy of Hogwarts in this way. Shane looked towards the direction where Peeves disappeared just now and said silently in his mind. After lunch, the only class left today starts at 15.30 in the afternoon. Until then, time belongs to you. Shane originally wanted to go to the library to read a book, but unexpectedly he met Percy Weasley, the Gryffindor head of year just after leaving the Great Hall. He told Shane that Professor McGonagall asked him to go to the Gryffindor Dean's office. Professor McGonagall's office is on the second floor of Hogwarts Castle, above the marble staircase in the foyer and next to the corridor. Because Shane really didn't want to take the stairs that changed all the time, he thought of taking a shortcut and flying directly onto the lawn outside. Boom, boom, boom. Shane flew to the window of Professor McGonagall's office, reached out and knocked on the window. In the office, Professor McGonagall heard a strange noise outside the window. She thought it was another stupid owl from the school that hit the window, so she ignored it. But as another strange noise came, she couldn't help but raise her head, and vaguely saw a figure outside the window. She quickly put on the glasses hanging around her neck. Professor McGonagall, can I come in? Shane knocked on the window again. Oh, my God. Professor McGonagall quickly stood up, ran over to open the window, and said, come in quickly. Shane flew into the office and saw a burning fireplace, and the Hogwarts Quidditch pitch could be seen outside the window. Mr. Dolea, do you know that you have seriously violated school rules? Professor McGonagall said angrily, students are not allowed to use magic in the corridors. I didn't use it in the corridor, I used it after I walked to the lawn. Shane said with a smile showing his white teeth. This sentence instantly left Professor McGonagall speechless, but she still said, since your dangerous behavior has affected other students, Ravenclaw will deduct 10 points. Huh, this is unreasonable. Shane protested, I don't remember who I affected. The Weasley twins are lying in the infirmary. Peeves said that he heard you teach them to use the levitation spell to fly. Quote dot 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 quote. This time it was Shane's turn to be speechless, because this was indeed about him. But he didn't expect Fred and George to be so brave. They had just told them to use the levitating spell, and they dared to use it in the chase before they had even practiced it. Seeing Shane's admission, Professor McGonagall sighed helplessly. She was really impressed by Shane as a student. When the two met for the first time, Shane had already shown abilities beyond ordinary people. She thought that such a student would be very proud or arrogant, but she never expected that Shane showed maturity and courtesy far beyond his peers. At the sorting ceremony, he once again accomplished the feat he had done when he was young, and today he caused quite a stir in the school because of his flying problem. Professor McGonagall slowly sat back on the chair and returned to her previous serious face. She asked Shane, Mr. Dolea, I came to you this time just to find out how far you have learned magic. What was supposed to come was still coming, but Shane didn't expect it to come so quickly. In fact, Shane is not afraid to show off his abilities. Being low-key is not in line with his character. It is also impossible to do things like pretending to be a pig and eating a tiger, otherwise he will easily turn into a pig. His principle of doing things is that if others don't offend me, I won't offend others. Everyone should be happy and don't take the initiative to cause trouble. He doesn't bother to think about other messy things. Too much intrigue will easily lead to gray hair. But of course, Shane can't expose all of himself, not because of anything else, but because it will cause a lot of trouble. Therefore, when faced with Professor McGonagall's question, Shane responded directly and ambiguously. Anyway, I know everything I need to know. 
Such an answer was not the answer Professor McGonagall wanted, but it was within her expectation. However, she also learned from this answer that Shane's attainments in magic had probably reached a very high level at this time. Okay, I understand. Seeing that Shane didn't want to elaborate, Professor McGonagall just nodded and did not continue to ask, you can go back, but I warn you again not to use magic casually in the school. Try to keep a low profile and don't influence other students. Oh, Shane pretended to nod in agreement, but he didn't agree in his heart. Let fairy tales wizards keep a low profile. Impossible. If the old men in the council heard this, they would probably say that Professor McGonagall was crazy. After leaving Professor McGonagall's office, Shane continued to go to the library as planned. The library of Hogwarts has at least tens of thousands of books, thousands of bookshelves, and hundreds of narrow passages. It is the most precious accumulation in wealth since the founding of Hogwarts. The librarian is Mrs. Irma Pants. She was a thin, old woman who looked like a malnourished vulture. She has a special knack for immediately identifying and punishing students who damage books. She is also an angry witch, especially when she discovers that someone is trying to destroy her cherished books. I have to say that when Shane saw Mrs. Pants, he was overwhelmed by her strong aura. The kind of crazy energy that is desperate for books and exuded without any concealment. Shane said, I can't afford to offend, I really can't afford to offend. Looking around the library, Shane found that most of the bookshelves contained history books, story books, biographies, etc. There are very few books on the knowledge of magic spells, and the content of these books only briefly talks about the inventors, invention processes, uses, etc. of magic spells. The knowledge contained in them is not as good as that of, standard charms, primary. What's going on? Hogwarts has collected so many things over the years since it was founded. Shane said angrily after walking around the library. So he wanted to set his sights on the forbidden book area on the fifth floor. He felt that there must be something he wanted to read there. But you can't enter this place blatantly, you have to think of another way. In this way, Shane, who had not learned enough in the library, returned to Ravenclaw's common room, where there were more than a thousand books. Pushing open the window of the Ravenclaw lounge, Shane jumped onto the carpet with a lifelong leap. He stood up and clapped his hands, and when he looked up, he suddenly saw a beautiful blonde girl standing not far away holding a book and looking at him blankly. I'm sorry to disturb your study. Shane scratched his head awkwardly, and then said, it's okay just go on and don't worry about me. After that, he walked towards the alcove bookshelf. Are you Shane Dolia? Ah, it's me. When he heard the girl behind him calling his name, Shane turned around stiffly and nodded. My name is Pinello Crevet, fourth grade. Pinello introduced himself first, then walked quickly to Shane and asked, I heard that you know a kind of flying magic, can you teach it to me? I've been looking through the books here for a long time, but I can't find any magic that can stabilize flight like you did this morning. Quote dot 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 quote. Shane was speechless by this sudden request. It's not because of Penelo's rashness, but because he feels that after so long of development in the European magic world, they still can't find a magic that can fly stably without a broomstick. Clivet. Just call me Penelo. Shane was interrupted just as he started to speak. He looked at Penelo's eyes that were full of curiosity, and for some reason there was a bit of stupidity in the clarity. Penelo, the magic I use is the floating spell. No, impossible. He was interrupted before he finished speaking. Penelo immediately denied, what you used is definitely not the floating spell, at least it's not the floating spell in the book. You have improved the spell, haven't you? Um. Upon hearing this, Shane immediately stopped being perfunctory. He raised his eyebrows and asked curiously, why do you think so? The levitating spell cannot control items that are out of sight. At first, I thought you cast the levitating spell on your clothes or shoes, but I saw that your attention was always distracted, whether it was this morning or noon. This means that you are not using a floating spell in the traditional sense. Furthermore, the same is true for the clean up a new scourgify you used in the sorting ceremony yesterday. No one has ever been able to use this magic spell to remove the stains on the sorting hat, but you did it. Both of these things show that you are extremely there may be the ability to improve the curse. Oh my god. Before I traveled through time, I heard that people from Ravenclaw were extremely intelligent, 
but I didn't expect it to be so true. Or is this an isolated phenomenon? Shane really didn't expect that someone would directly judge that he had improved the magic spell based on just two simple things, because this requires a huge knowledge base to distinguish the essential difference between the magic spell he used and the traditional magic spell. You're right, what I use is indeed not a traditional floating spell. Shane sighed, with a hint of helplessness in his smile, but I'm sorry, Pinello, I can't teach you. I can't say the specific reason, but I can tell you that you can fly like me even without using my improved levitation spell. But people can't keep looking at themselves with their eyes, just like people can't lift themselves up. Penelo said. You are wrong. People can look at themselves with another pair of eyes, but you ignored it. After saying that, Shane gently raised the wand in his hand, and the chair next to him suddenly turned into a mirror. I think you are smart and will find the answer. After saying that, Shane turned around and continued towards the alcove. In fact, all the magic spells used by Shane were basically transformed into magic circles using origin. It's just that it was not used with full strength, the magic circle just flashed by during the casting process, and no one could detect it. The reason why Shane rejected Penelo was not because he was afraid that the magic circle would be leaked, but because the learning of the magic circle cannot be completed overnight. It has a systematic learning process. If you just rely on people to teach you, it's completely half the result with half the effort. In a slant, when all magicians begin to learn magic, they must first learn how to release a basic magic circle. How to carve the array pattern, how to fix and stabilize the array pattern, how to pour magic power into the formed magic array without causing it to explode out of control, and finally how to complete the stable release of magic. These things are all basic and need to be learned from an early age, even for Shane who has origin. After completing the study of basic magic circles, a person has the conditions to become a magician, and he can start to practice his own awakening magic or learn to practice some traditional magic. But one thing to note here is that whether you are self-awakening or learning traditions, you must only practice one or two kinds of magic at most. The reason is that the magic circles of different types of magic are unique and incompatible. If you don't pay attention to the details when condensing the magic circle, it can easily cause the magic to fail or even cause the magic circle to explode out of control, causing the caster to be seriously injured. And Shane is able to ignore such restrictions because he has the bug-like natal magic of origin which increases the speed of his magic practice hundreds or thousands of times. Therefore, in such a complicated practice system, Shane would not be willing to spend so much time teaching people without the help of teaching materials, not to mention that he did not know Penelo's character. If the magic circle is taught rashly, God knows what she will do is, Raven's Claw, so it's better to be more cautious. However, the incident with Penelo reminded Shane a little bit. As time goes by, the power of the magic circle will definitely not be concealed, so we have to find a suitable way to eliminate unnecessary troubles as early as possible. Four days have passed since school started. Today is Friday and there is potions class in the morning. After Shane finished his breakfast in a sleepy state, he came to the potions classroom. There is still some time before class starts, but everyone in the classroom is already seated. This is probably because Snape is notorious and everyone doesn't want to be caught in a pigtail by him. Shane. Hermione saw Shane come into the classroom and sit next to her, and skillfully took out all the tools needed for potions class. She suddenly looked confused, what are you doing in the potions classroom? This class, but we went with Slytherin. It doesn't matter, I've taken other classes too. Shane said with a smile, this can save a lot of time. This strange answer immediately confused Hermione. On the other side, on the 8th floor of Hogwarts castle, is the principal's office. At this time, a woman in noble clothes suddenly appeared in a portrait on the wall. She said to Dumbledore in front of the table, Albus, the student you asked us to pay attention to appeared in the history of magic classroom and the magic school at the same time today. Medicine classroom. The quill in Dumbledore's hand suddenly stopped, he raised his head and asked, Evra, what's going on? That child was divided into two people, the former headmaster of Hogwarts, Evra replied. Quote dot dot dot. Okay, I understand. Dumbledore put down his quill and fell into deep thought. When Evra saw this, he did not continue to say anything. Instead, 
He turned his head and walked towards the depth of the portrait, disappearing into the portrait again and again. After a while, Dumbledore stood up. He picked up an unopened letter that had just been delivered by an owl, looking thoughtful again. The perspective returns to the potions classroom. Shane, don't be ridiculous. This is Professor Snape's class. Haven't you heard about his reputation in the school? Hermione persuaded, you can leave now before Professor Snape comes. I'm afraid it's too late. As soon as Shane finished speaking, the door of the potions classroom was suddenly pushed open with a bang, and then a figure walked in quickly, and its high-pressure aura instantly plunged the originally noisy classroom into silence. He has a thin body, straight hair, cold and unfathomable eyes, sallow complexion, a big aquiline nose, and is wearing a black robe and cloak, like a big bat. Yes, completely in line with Snape's characteristics. I saw him walking quickly onto the podium, facing the students with his hands folded, condescending and saying in a cold voice. This class doesn't require you to do silly waving of wands or mutter incantations, so I don't think many of you will appreciate the depth and sophistication of potion making. However, for those few who are truly interested. Having said this, Snape gave Malfoy a vague look, which made Malfoy suddenly look proud. I can teach you how to confuse your mind and senses, I can teach you how to win declaration in glory, I can even teach you how to live forever. Well, now roll call. After a threatening speech, Snape opened the roster on the table. At the same time, Hermione leaned into Shane's ear and whispered. I asked you to leave just now but you didn't leave. Now it's too late. Professor Snape is the dean of Slytherin College. I heard from second-year students that he would often deduct points from other colleges for various reasons during class. As a result, Slytherin has won the House Cup in recent years. I know this. Shane looked indifferent, however, this seems to have nothing to do with me, and I have already added enough points to our college this week, so it doesn't matter if I deduct a few points. In the first week of school, Shane scored a lot of points for Ravenclaw with his superior understanding of various subjects. At the same time, because Friday afternoon was Ravenclaw's first potions class, Shane had not yet received any extra points from Snape. Of course, when facing Snape, no points are deducted but points are added. As someone who basically knows the ending of Harry Potter, to a certain extent, Shane still admires Snape. Compared to other professors at Hogwarts, Snape is indeed ruthless, cold, and mean. He often criticizes and embarrasses students mercilessly. He does have a bad personality. But at the same time, he also has many accolades. Master of Potions, Half-Blood Prince and Master of Occlumency. Severus Snape, he was extremely devoted and loved Harry Potter's mother Lily Evans throughout his life. He is willing to endure everyone's misunderstanding and silently protect the children of his beloved and his enemies. At the end of the finale, he stared into Harry's mother's eyes until he died. He even wandered between Dumbledore and Voldemort, miraculously completing the undercover mission and making great contributions to Voldemort's demise later on. He is very responsible and responsible. Before the Battle of Hogwarts, as the principal, he tried his best to protect the students from the Death Eaters, thus preserving his vitality for the decisive battle that followed. He is extremely outstanding. He is the youngest headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry since its establishment the youngest headmaster of Slytherin College in history, a professor of potions, a professor of defense against the dark arts, and a recipient of the Second Order of Merlin. Therefore, compared to the various difficulties he made to his students, what he did should be more worthy of praise. That's why Shane admires Snape. In the classroom, Snape stopped just as he read Harry Potter's name. He whispered with a hint of sarcasm. Oh yes. Harry Potter, this is our new arrival, a famous character. Then again, maybe some of you came to Hogwarts with extraordinary abilities and extraordinary self-confidence. So, Potter, tell me, what would I get if I added Narcissus root powder to a mugwort infusion? Snape started to embarrass Harry without even bothering to name him, just because Harry looked exactly like his enemy except for his eyes. Listening to Snape's aggressive question, Harry glanced nervously at Ronald next to him, but Ronald was just as stunned as he was. Instead, Hermione, who was sitting next to Shane, raised her hand high. I don't know, Professor. Harry replied, licking his lips and even shaking a little as he spoke. Tisk, tisk, it seems that fame doesn't mean everything. 
Snape curled his lips contemptuously, then let's try again. Potter, if I asked you to find me a bazaar, where would you look for it? I don't know, Professor. Harry's eyes were gradually filled with confusion and anger. He didn't understand why the professor in front of him was making things so difficult for him. But Hermione was still like that, raising her hands high, wanting to stand up and answer the question directly. I think you didn't read a single book before school started, right, Potter? Snape's mocking tone deepened, and he continued to ask, then tell me about Econodum Scaphoids and Econodum Wolfsbane. What's the difference? I don't know, Professor. Harry tried his best to look Snape in the eyes, but he couldn't stand Snape's aura and slowly lowered his head. Then, since Potter can't answer, please ask another gentleman to answer me. At this moment, Snape suddenly turned to Shane without any warning, I just discovered that a cat suddenly sneaked into our class. Stupid bald eagle. Mr. Dolea, if you cannot answer the three questions I just asked, Ravenclaw will deduct 50 points for your stupid behavior of running into the wrong classroom. Shane looked at Snape with dead eyes. The name Bald Eagle has a bit of a range, right? But Shane, who knew what kind of person Snape was, didn't care. He slowly stood up, took Hermione's hand down next to him, and said. Narcissus root powder and mugwort can be mixed together to prepare a very powerful sleeping pill, which is a dose of water of life and death. Bazaar is a stone taken from the stomach of a cow and has a strong detoxifying effect. As for Econodum scapularis and Wolfsbane and Econodum are the same plant and are also collectively known as Econodum. This is not difficult for Shane at all. He has already memorized these basic knowledge using memory magic, and can retrieve it from his brain like a computer when needed. Snape's face was still gloomy when he heard Shane gave the correct answer, but he did not continue to embarrass Shane. Instead, he shouted to everyone in the classroom. See, so why don't you write this all down? A powerful aura filled the entire classroom, and the students were so frightened that they lowered their heads and wrote furiously, fearing that Snape's fangs would bite them. Potter, because of your ignorance, Gryffindor will be deducted five points for this. Snape looked at Harry coldly, as for Mr. Dolea, although you answered the question correctly, because you went to the wrong classroom, Ravenclaw will deduct five points for this. Point. Quote dot 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 quote. Shane didn't speak or explain because he knew that it would be useless even if he said it. Not to mention, at least I can keep Ravenclaw from being deducted 10 points. Why aren't you leaving? Snape asked with a frown as he stared at Shane. Professor, I'm here for the history of magic class this morning. I'll just sit here and listen. Shane replied with a fake smile. Snape narrowed his eyes. He looked at the complete set of equipment for refining potions in front of Shane. He felt that the student in front of him didn't just run into the wrong classroom, but came completely prepared. Snape didn't agree to Shane's request, but he didn't refuse either. He went straight to lecture, which meant that Shane could stay here. Snape divided everyone into teams of two and began to instruct them in making a simple potion to treat scabies. And coincidentally, because there is one more Shane, the little wizards in the classroom just make up an even number. Potions is a subject that Shane needs to focus on and study seriously at Hogwarts, because the learning ability of Origin does not include anything other than magic. Making potions is very complex and difficult. Whether it is the order or the number of grams of materials, each step requires precise operation, and even the mixing direction and number of turns have strict requirements. Just like the simple scabies potion in front of him, Shane strictly followed the steps on Snape's blackboard and almost failed in the middle. Snape even deducted another five points from Ravenclaw for this. Moreover, Shane discovered that the scabies potion was very dangerous before it was made. Neville at the next table got a little bit of it and was covered in scabies. He was sent directly to the infirmary. Later, two little snakes were carried out. Madame Pomfrey might have to curse again. It wasn't until the bell rang and Snape walked out of the classroom that the little wizards finally breathed a sigh of relief. I have to say that this potions class is as timid as a war. Mr. Doria, Professor Dumbledore wants to see you. After the potions class, Shane was about to leave the classroom when he bumped into Professor McGonagall walking towards him and said. No way, here we go again. Shane held his forehead and sighed. He really couldn't understand why he kept grabbing onto him when he didn't do anything harmful. Isn't it just a bit too public? 
I'll wait for you in the library. Hermione next to her said in a low voice when she saw that Shane was busy. Shane nodded helplessly, then turned around and weakly said to Professor McGonagall, Let's go, Professor McGonagall. Although this was bound to happen sooner or later, Shane didn't expect that less than a week after the start of school, he would run into Dumbledore, the white devil who was respected and feared by the entire European wizarding community. Are you really too high profile? Shane is doing some temporary reflection in his mind. Dumbledore's office is located in a separate small tower in Hogwarts. Like the lounges of the four major houses, you need to give the correct password to enter. Guarding the principal's office is a huge stone beast. Behind the stone beast is an automatic spiral staircase. At the top of the staircase is the office door. Pile of cockroaches. Professor McGonagall said the command to the guarding stone beast. The stone beast slowly opened, revealing the stairs at the back. Professor McGonagall took Shane up, and the stone beast slowly closed. Climbing the stairs, a gleaming oak door is inlaid with a brass knocker in the shape of a griffin. When I opened the oak door and entered the room, I saw an old man with a white beard standing at a table eating piles of cockroaches. Albus, Mr. Doria has arrived. Professor McGonagall said looking at Dumbledore's sugar-stained white beard with a bit of disgust. Oh, welcome, Mr. Dolea, would you like some cockroaches? Dumbledore turned his head with a smile and looked into Shane's eyes with deep eyes, as if he wanted to know something from them. At this moment, the traveler from another world and the devil of the world finally meet. Professor Dumbledore, it is very impolite to use legilimency to peek into other people's brains, let alone your own students. Shane sighed helplessly and said as if he didn't care. Just now, he vaguely felt the power of prying eyes, and immediately understood that the old bee in front of him must be using legilimency, but he was not using his full strength, otherwise the reaction of thinking barrier would not be so small. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. Dumbledore looked away hurriedly like a child who was caught doing bad things by an adult. So, Professor, why did you come to see me? Shane asked knowingly. He walked over to Dumbledore, took out one of the cockroaches running around in the glass jar, and put it directly into his mouth. This thing looks no different from an ordinary cockroach. It looks very disgusting. Its appearance alone will directly discourage many people, let alone eating it. But for Shane, he eats it without any pressure. When he was at Blue Star, he had eaten all kinds of cow-shattered pots and insect feasts, and the cockroach pile was at best a kind of candy made into the shape of a cockroach. He has eaten real bugs, so what is there to be afraid of? There was even one time when he was looking for bamboo maggots to eat in the mountains. As long as there was no dada, he washed them and threw them raw into his mouth. Unknowingly, he ate too much and developed a protein allergy. In the end, he was sent directly to the hospital. Chewing it in your mouth, not to mention that the pile of cockroaches is quite delicious. The taste is crispy and sweet, but the cockroach legs are a bit irritating to the tongue. It would be nice if the sweetness could be lowered a little so as not to be so cloying. Just eating one feels like a big spoonful of wild honey has been stuffed into your mouth. After hearing Shane's question, Dumbledore was silent for a few seconds, and then asked, Mr. Dolea, who taught you your magic? I think Professor McGonagall should have told you about this issue. Shane grabbed another handful of cockroaches and put them in his mouth. Actually, Professor, you don't have to worry about anything. I came to Hogwarts just to study. You regard me as an unstable factor, which is unnecessary. I'm not that lunatic Voldemort, I have my own will. Shane didn't feel any surprise that Dumbledore would ask this question. Because if it were him, a student who completely transcended common sense suddenly appeared in the magic school he was in charge of, and this student came from an ordinary muggle family. How could this not attract attention? This is common sense and Shane can fully understand it. However, when Dumbledore heard Shane actually mention the three words Voldemort, a slight wave of emotion finally appeared on his originally calm face. It's truly amazing, Mr. Dolia. Dumbledore's expression became a little serious, you should know what it means to directly say this name. Since his death until now, no one dares to call him by his first name. Is he really dead, Professor Dumbledore? Everyone else seemed to have imagined him so horribly that they forgot that just ten years ago, he was beaten into this ugly appearance by someone they regarded as an ant, just like a parasite can only survive by clinging to others. 
Shane puffed out his cheeks and made chewing sounds from his mouth, looking calm. For someone with a sweet tooth, couldn't he smell the strong smell of garlic on Professor Quirrell? That's to cover up the rancid smell. Quote dot 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 quote. Dumbledore fell silent again. Shane's calmness and maturity, and what he knew completely exceeded my expectations. At this time, Dumbledore was thinking about how to deal with the relationship with this little wizard who was completely unreasonable. Mr. Dolea, if it is not convenient for you to tell your teacher's name, then it is not easy for me to ask. I am also very willing to believe you and will not do anything to harm Hogwarts. Dumbledore said suddenly, but, I still want to ask you not to reveal anything about Quirrell, especially to Harry, Harry Potter. After hearing Dumbledore's words, Shane was speechless and an ellipsis appeared on his head. Because he found that Dumbledore seemed to have found a good reason for him, and even skipped the step of creating credibility. Although he didn't know why the 109-year-old man in front of him, who could be called a living fossil, made such a judgment, Shane decided to let nature take its course and follow Dumbledore's words. Then, Professor, this is not a request at all. I have no intention of intervening in Professor Quirrell's matter, Shane said with a pun. This answer not only showed that Shane agreed to Dumbledore's request, but also showed that he had no intention of paying attention to Dumbledore's desire to use Quirrell or Voldemort to train Harry. But to be honest, Shane really couldn't figure out why the White Devil, known as the Magical World, was bound by a small prophecy. It has been ten years since Voldemort was seriously injured. What on earth has Dumbledore been doing for such a long time, even though he knows that the nostril sockets are not completely dead? Foolishly waiting for Harry to enter school, and then training him to be the savior who can destroy Voldemort according to the prophecy. To be honest, Shane wouldn't believe it to his death. With Dumbledore's prestige and power, if he could not relax his investigation of Voldemort within these ten years, at least he would be able to find out about the Horcruxes and at least one of them. Two destroyed. Moreover, even though Dumbledore believed that the prophecy would definitely come true, there were many ways to train people, but he chose a radical, extremely risky and uncertain method. I am really not afraid that the savior has not been cultivated, so I have to create a second generation Dark Lord first. Moreover, Shane still doesn't understand. What is Dumbledore afraid of? As for Dumbledore, who defeated Gellert Grindelwald and ended the first wizarding war, as long as he is alive, Voldemort will always be like a rat in the gutter, and it is impossible to rule the European wizarding world. Shane once found an old diary in a junk shop, which contained detailed records of the bloody war led by Grindelwald decades ago that affected almost the entire world. In order to win, the saints under Grindelwald used all possible means, and each method was more ruthless than the last. If a terrorist like Voldemort had been placed at that time, the whirlpool of war would have killed him in an instant. Tear into pieces. Shane bets that Voldemort can live longer than a month while he washes his hair while standing on his head. Thank you, Mr. Dolea. Seeing Shane agree, Dumbledore's serious expression gradually relaxed. However, just when he was about to ask Shane out of the office, Shane shot the words in his throat into his stomach in advance. Now, now that you've finished talking about your business, Professor, it's time to talk about mine. Shane used his sugar-stained hands to take out a piece of parchment from his clothes. I saw the time, date and various Hogwarts teaching subjects written on it. Professor Dumbledore, I've been wanting to talk to you about this for a long time. Now that I'm here today, no matter what, I want to discuss the Hogwarts curriculum arrangement with you. Look, our current first grade course schedule. In the following period, Shane began to instill in Dumbledore the teaching philosophy of flower gardeners exam-oriented education, and proposed to increase the current average of 1.2 classes per day at Hogwarts to 5 to 6 classes, focusing on first-year students, so that they can lay a good foundation. Listening to Shane's resentful and eloquent speech, Dumbledore was covered in cold sweat. He couldn't understand how these little wizards could offend you and come up with such a cruel and inhumane course arrangement. Mr. Dolea, listen to me first. I know you are also thinking about your classmates at Hogwarts. Dumbledore interrupted Shane with a headache and explained, but have you ever thought about our professors simply don't have that much energy to take care of so many courses? You have to know that except for the seventh year students in the entire Hogwarts, all other grades need professors to teach them. Huh, how big a big deal is this? 
Wouldn't it be nice to recruit more professors? I don't believe you can't even find a few professors. Shane said nonchalantly. But Hogwarts doesn't have that much funding. Dumbledore explained. Hogwarts funding is mostly supported by the traditional British wizarding families. It's impossible for them to give a penny more, unless I transfer Hogwarts to hand over some of Watt's management rights. Gold Galleons. Hearing that it turned out to be a lack of money, Shane couldn't help but cast his eyes toward the forbidden forest outside the window. Dumbledore followed Shane's gaze and couldn't help but know what Shane was thinking about. He quickly said. No, 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 this is not possible. Mr. Dolea, you should go back. Fox. The phoenix that had been nesting on a gilded perch nearby spread its wings. With a long cry, a flame rushed toward Shane. Alas, alas, I haven't finished speaking yet. Shane complained. But just before Fox sent him away, he also left his last words to Dumbledore, Horcruxes. Voldemort is immortal. But before I could finish speaking, I was completely surrounded by flames. I have long said that this boy is an extremely bad little wizard. I should have sent him to Azkaban right then and there. The sorting hat said suddenly on a shelf behind the desk. At the same time, the portraits of the previous Hogwarts principals hanging on the wall also began to speak. This boy is strange, Albus. The source of his power is unknown. And he's only 11 years old, how could he know so many things? The people behind him, or his teachers, are certainly not simple people who can teach these things. The headmasters were chattering and discussing, but Dumbledore had no intention of listening to them at this time. He stared at the place where Shane disappeared, the light in his eyes became sharper, and it was obvious that he heard Shane's last message. Evra, please inform Severus and ask him to come here. Dumbledore suddenly interrupted the headmasters, discussion, and the noisy office suddenly became quiet. Facing Dumbledore's request, Evra just nodded without saying a word turned around and disappeared into the portrait. Less than ten minutes later, the oak door of the principal's office was pushed open again, and Snape walked in, dragging his usual black robes. Headmaster. Severus, do you know about Horcruxes? Dumbledore asked straight to the point. Horcrux. Snape frowned, as if he thought of something, you mean. Yes, we should have thought of it a long time ago, the secret of his immortality. Dumbledore held a hand on the corner of the table and said coldly, has he ever revealed the Horcrux to you? In my memory, no. Snape said firmly, I would like to ask, does the source of the intelligence come from Shane Dolea? You know. On the way here, some students said that a flame suddenly appeared in the corridor, and then Doria suddenly appeared there. Snape explained, are you sure Doria is trustworthy? In just one week since school started, he has caused a lot of things in the school. You must know that some of my old friends successfully escaped from the Ministry of Magic and are still missing. This is something I asked a friend from the Ministry of Magic to investigate. Dumbledore handed Snape an opened letter. It contains some information about Shane Dolea. Dolea seems to have been adopted. More than a year ago, his surname was Swinton, and his name was not Shane. Before he was 10 years old, he was no different from ordinary muggle children, and he didn't even show any potential to become a wizard. But just after he turned 10, he inexplicably changed his name, and the person who adopted him changed his name inexplicably. There was no reaction from the family. My friend also retrieved the records of magical phenomena near Dolea's house in the past year, and found that since Dolea was 10 years old, the number of magical phenomena near his home has been more than 10 times greater than before. Do you suspect that Dolea's real family came to find him? Snape asked, looking at the investigation report in his hand roughly. Yes, if the people who taught Dolea magic were Death Eaters, then with their behavior, it would be impossible for the Swinton family to be alive. Dumbledore speculated. Is it possible that the real Dolea died when he was 10 years old and someone used Polyjuice Potion to replace him? Severus, everyone must be responsible for what they say. Don't you think it's childish for a potions master to say such things? Dumbledore's eyes suddenly turned stern, at least you can tell whether someone has drunk or not. It's Polyjuice Potion. But Headmaster, Dolia is still very suspicious. Snape said with a sullen face, still insisting, I can't trust him, at least there is no reason to prove that he is worthy of trust now. Severus, he's just a child. 
Dumbledore's eyes showed a look of memory and remorse, I was exactly the same as you are now, but it turns out that I was wrong. My distrust created an extremely dangerous black man. Wizard, I don't want you to make the same mistake I did. Trust me, Severus. Dolea is trustworthy. The reason why Dumbledore said these words was not because of anything else, but because he knew through the portraits what Shane once said to Hermione, power will control people. If a person does not have a mature will and thoughts, he will not be able to do anything. A way to control the power of magic. So with just this simple sentence, Dumbledore can clearly know what kind of person Shane is. Shane Dolea, he is an extremely calm person, he has his own thoughts and will. He is not like the original Tom, who only had strength in his eyes until he fell into the abyss. He clearly knows what he is doing. And Snape heard that Dumbledore actually persuaded Shane like this. Even though he was full of doubts, he couldn't say anything. He threw the report about Shane on the table with a gloomy face, then turned around and walked quickly towards the office door. Severus, Horcrux. Dumbledore reminded as he looked at Snape's disappearing back. Snape didn't respond, but Dumbledore knew he knew what he was going to do. After Snape left, a look of helplessness suddenly appeared on Dumbledore's face. He slowly walked to a black cabinet in the office and opened it. There was a wide, flat, hollow, shallow stone basin made of metal or stone placed in the cabinet. Runes and symbols were carved on the edge of the basin. This is the pensive, where the bright silver substance turned into memories by thoughts is stored. Dumbledore lay down in front of the pensive, pointed the elder wand at his temple, and then pulled out a ray of glowing white catkins. Putting the memory into the pensive, Dumbledore entered the memory of the past, and he wanted to find the future in the past that had been ignored. But after some time, Dumbledore pulled his thoughts away from the memory. Unfortunately, he didn't find anything useful, indeed because the young Voldemort was too perfect during his time at Hogwarts. However, there is nothing perfect in this world. Dumbledore thoughtfully closed the black cabinet where the pensive was placed, and slowly walked back to his snack table. While he was thinking deeply, he opened the glass jar containing the cockroaches and put his hand in, but the result. Nothing was touched. Oh, God, he ate all my cockroaches. Dumbledore looked at the completely empty glass jar with annoyance. Shane didn't even leave him a single cockroach leg. It looks like I have to ask Honeydukes to send some over, but before that. Fox, please send me to Nico. Dumbledore wanted to go to Nico Flamel. He would know more about the Horcruxes. As soon as he finished speaking, Fox spread his wings, and his whole body ignited with golden flames again. After a cry, a phoenix and an old man with a white beard disappeared into the principal's office. On the other side, after Shane was surrounded by Fox's flames, he saw a flash of fire in front of his eyes and went directly to the corridor on the first floor of Hogwarts, where he even squatted down. I haven't finished speaking yet. Shane stood up, rubbed his butt and complained. He looked up to the sky and found that it was already getting late. He took out the mechanical pocket watch in his pocket and looked at it. Oh ho, it's almost six o'clock, it's time to cook. He and Hermione had originally agreed to go to the library to read together after potions class, but because of old B's interference, he has now broken the appointment. It's definitely too late to go to the library now. So Shane took out his wand and waved it casually, go. An owl of light and shadow immediately flew out. In the library on the second floor of Hogwarts, Hermione was concentrating on reading a book. But suddenly, she heard a commotion around her, so she looked up curiously. It turned out to be a glowing owl flying into the library from the window. Shane. Hermione immediately recognized the author of this magic. She had only seen Shane use it in the entire Hogwarts. The owl landed in front of Hermione, and the body of light and shadow suddenly dispersed into tiny particles of light, and recomposed a text on the table, I am in the Great Hall. It also comes with a pattern of, a bowl filled with rice and a chopstick placed on top. Hermione was stunned when she saw this. Before she could react, she heard Mrs. Pants's angry voice coming from not far away. Which little dares to use magic in the library. Hermione felt a chill rush up her back when she heard the sound, and immediately put away her books and ran outside the library. She didn't want Mrs. Pants to find out that the owl was related to her. Even the Weasley twins, who were famous for their pranks at Hogwarts, didn't dare to cause trouble in the library. 
That would be very tragic. Leaving the library, Hermione hurried to the Great Hall. It was dinner time, and the whole auditorium was full of people, but Hermione quickly recognized the figure who was being watched and feasting. Hermione walked slowly to Shane. She looked at the piles of empty plates stacked extremely high, and was shocked beyond measure. How can a little wizard eat so much? Even adults can't eat so much, right? But actually, there's a reason why Shane eats so much. Origin can indeed help Shane passively increase the magic capacity in his body, but this passive will also consume a lot of Shane's physical strength. If he doesn't eat more, he will be sucked dry by his own magic. Shane. Hermione stepped forward. Oh. Hermione, you're here. Shane swallowed a piece of mutton chop, handed a chicken drumstick to Hermione and said, here, here's this for you. I'll eat later. What does Professor Dumbledore want to see you for? Well, Shane held a piece of lamb chop in his mouth, looked up at the ceiling of the auditorium, and then asked, do you want to hear the truth or a lie? Do you want to hear the truth or lies? Shane asked. What do you think? Hermione rolled her eyes. If she doesn't listen to the truth, why should she listen to lies? Isn't this a waste of time? Oh, you want to hear the lies first, right? Shane pretended not to hear Hermione's words and looked serious. No, you heard wrong, I just wanted to. Faced with Shane's teasing, Hermione naively thought that Shane really didn't hear clearly and wanted to explain, but she didn't expect that Shane interrupted her directly. The lie is that after Dumbledore's repeated requests, I promised him not to use magic in Hogwarts. Quote dot 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 quote. It's really a lie. Not only Hermione, but also the little wizards around them fell silent for a moment when they heard Shane's words. In just one week of school, Shane has used magic more times in school than all first and second graders. For example, in the library, when Mrs. Pinksy wasn't paying attention, she sucked the magic on the bookshelf into her hand. For another example, when Shane walks to a staircase, and it happens that the staircase starts to move randomly, Shane will pull out his wand and immediately pull the moving staircase back. This seems to have led to the current situation in the school. The stairs don't seem to dare to be moved casually. For another example, Shane took a fancy to a piece of open space outside the forbidden forest of Hogwarts, so he opened a garden there and planted various fruits and vegetables on it. Nowadays, little wizards with nothing to do come there every day to take a look. Farm tools such as hoes, shovels, and kettles are still automatically helping Shane take care of the newly sprouted fruits and vegetables. There are countless similar things. Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick also talked to Shane one after another, saying that Shane was a serious violation of school rules. But faced with the questioning of Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick, Shane did not panic at all. He silently took out the Hogwarts school rules that he had prepared long ago and started a sophistry that was difficult to refute in front of the two professors. Quote exclamation mark. According to the first rule of Hogwarts, students are not allowed to use magic in the school corridors. But Shane said that every time he used magic, he was not in the corridor. The place where he took off or used magic was either in the atrium or the lawn outside the castle or in the library, or on some staircase that he didn't like. The portraits and ghosts of Hogwarts can all vouch for him. Moreover, there is no rule in the Hogwarts school rules that prohibits students from growing vegetables in school. Professor Dumbledore just said that students are not allowed to enter the Forbidden Forest. His vegetable garden is not in the Forbidden Forest. So, after several repeated persuasion from Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick, Shane still went his own way. Both professors expressed their helplessness and in the end simply ignored Shane. There is no need for a young person to be angry with a student, not to mention that the student did not violate school rules. So, now the young wizards at Hogwarts can always randomly see a person flying around somewhere in the school, and they are basically used to it. Therefore, whether it is Hermione or others, rather than believing that Shane does not use magic casually in the school, they are more willing to believe that the Weasley twins do not engage in pranks. Tell the truth. Seeing Shane's pretentious look, Hermione picked up the book in her hand and threw it over, but the book stopped just a palm away from Shane. Don't get excited, it will be bad if you hit your classmates. Shane moved the floating book aside, to be honest, I actually don't know why that old bee is looking for me, it seems he just wants to chat with me. Chat. Talk. 
Hermione obviously didn't believe it, and what the hell was the title old B? She saw with her own eyes that it was Professor McGonagall who took Shane away. If they just wanted to have a chat, just ask a student to notify him. Moreover, she didn't think that the principal was busy with everything. He just wanted to chat with Shane. What were you talking about? Hermione asked curiously. At first, Old B just asked me who taught me magic, but then the conversation turned to Voldemort. Voldemort. Hermione looked confused, who is he? As soon as he finished speaking, there was a crisp sound of knives and forks smashing dishes next to him. Because Hermione didn't restrain her voice just now, some young wizards born in wizarding families nearby heard the name, Voldemort, and instantly showed expressions of fear. He didn't even care about the dinner in front of him and quickly distanced himself. What are you doing? I'm just asking Fu. Hush, hush. The few young wizards who were retreating quickly put their index fingers to their lips to signal Hermione not to say that name. This. Hermione turned her pleading eyes to Shane. And when Shane looked at Hermione, he remembered that Hermione had just been exposed to the magical world for a short time, and Voldemort's name was almost forbidden to be spoken, so she still didn't know who Voldemort was. Well, let's put it this way, anyway, just think of him as the leader of a terrorist murder organization whose mind is filled with extremely bloody thoughts every day. That's fine. Shane still didn't want Hermione to know too much, it wouldn't do her any good, and it would most likely arouse the Gryffindor little lion's desire for discovery in her heart. However, Hermione didn't seem to realize Shane's intentions. She was staring at Shane with a very unique look, and grabbed Shane's hands while he was eating. Say, clear, clear, Hermione said word by word. PFF'd. Shane couldn't help but laugh out loud when he saw Hermione's angry look, and then he suppressed his laughter and said, the look in your eyes is exactly the same as the look in my Fiona's eyes when she's hungry. Fiona, my owl, quote dot 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 quote. Hermione immediately picked up another book next to her and threw it over, but still didn't touch Shane. Then the two played with each other for a while, and then Shane pressed Hermione's little head and said, okay, stop making trouble. I won't tell you about Voldemort. After all, it's not something you should know right now. But if you really want to know, don't ask anyone without any explanation, otherwise they will think you are crazy. After saying that, Shane packed 20 ham sausages and 30 chicken legs on the table, and then left the auditorium leisurely. And just when he walked out of the door, Hermione slowly landed from midair. She looked angrily at the direction Shane disappeared, smoothed her messed up hair, and sat there starting to sulk. On the other side, Shane took off directly from the lawn outside after leaving the auditorium and went straight to the outside of Ravenclaw Tower. After opening the common room window and raising the curtains in a familiar manner, Shane wanted to go back to the common room as usual, reading a book and drinking a cup of hot cocoa. But unexpectedly, as soon as he entered the window, he saw at least 20 eaglets in Ravenclaw's common room, each staring at his own mirror in front of him, and whispering to each other from time to time, talking about something. A weird scene. When Shane saw this, he immediately felt that the scene in front of him was probably related to him. So with the mentality of not disturbing his classmates, Shane planned to quietly fly back out the window and go directly back to the dormitory. But he never thought that as soon as he turned around, he would be caught by someone who heard movement at the window. Penelo was tugging at Shane's robe and said, Shane, you are finally back. Shane suddenly broke out in a cold sweat, because Pinello's words directly showed that he was the one who caused the strange phenomenon in the Ravenclaw lounge. Shane turned his head with a stiff neck and said with a twitching corner of his mouth, Good evening, Pinello. At this time, the hawks in the lounge also noticed Shane's return, so they all came forward one after another. Dolea, we have been waiting for you for a long time. Explain to us what another pair of eyes is. Yes, yes. Quote dot 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 quote. Shane was confused as he listened to the chirping of the eaglets. The messy voices gave him a headache, and he quickly shouted. Stop, stop, quiet, can anyone tell me what happened? The eaglets suddenly became quiet and looked at each other, and Penelo also began to talk about the reasons for what happened. It turned out that that day, after Shane had a conversation with Penelo on how to use the levitation curse Wingardium Leviosa to fly, 
Penelo stayed in the lounge or dormitory whenever he had time during this period, looking blankly. Keep looking in the mirror. At first, Ravenclaw's eagle didn't feel anything about Penelo's strange behavior. Anyway, there were usually a lot of people doing weird things in the academy. But until this afternoon, things suddenly changed. Ravenclaw's senior Ivana Blanchard had just returned from class when she saw her successor squatting there and looking in the mirror again. So she stepped forward out of curiosity and asked, Penelo, I saw you have been looking at the mirror these past few days. What are you doing? Nothing, I just heard from Shane that we have a pair of neglected eyes. As long as we find these eyes, we can fly using the levitating spell. Penelo looked at the mirror and explained, but I watched it for several days, I still can't understand the meaning of Shane's words, but I know what he said is right, because I feel that the answer is right in front of me, but I failed to grasp it. You mean Shane Dolea? Ivana sat next to Penelo and asked, tell me carefully, what did Dolea say? It was obvious that she was also confused by Penelo. Curiosity aroused. So next, Penelo told Ivana almost all of Shane's exact words, and while the two were talking, another little eagle also walked into the lounge. As soon as he entered the door, he suddenly saw two beauties sitting in front of a mirror and posting stickers, so he wanted to go up and strike up a conversation, but unexpectedly as soon as he walked in, he was attracted by the topic of flying between the two. In this way, it spreads from 1 to 10, and from 10 to 100. For a whole afternoon, Half of the people in Ravenclaw were involved in the discussion of how to use the levitation curse Wingardium Leviosa to fly. Some people even skipped dinner and just looked in the mirror in the lounge. After listening to Penelo's explanation of the cause and effect, Shane was stunned. No, my mirror is just a reminder, I don't want you to look at it all the time. Also, even if Penelo is like this, why would other eaglets be like this? Were Ravenclaw's hawks really a bunch of freaks? Shane felt that if he didn't directly tell them how to fly using the levitation curse Wingardium Leviosa today, I'm afraid the entire Ravenclaw eaglets would be in this weird learning state until they understood the answer on their own. This is completely unavoidable. Shane sighed helplessly, already planning to teach the eaglets how to fly using the levitating spell. Shane asked all the eaglets present, you all want to know how to fly using the levitation spell? Yeah. The little eagles nodded, expressing that they wanted to know. Okay, I'll talk to everyone in detail. Shane pulled out his wand and started to enter teacher mode. Everyone, put your wands away. We don't need wands in this class. As soon as he finished speaking, the eaglets put away their wands and took out their notebooks and quills. Listen carefully, I will only speak once. In this world, we all have two pairs of eyes. The first pair are the physical eyes, which are the ones on the face. Shane tapped the corners of his eyes with his wand, the physical eyes can see near but not far, see forward but not behind, see light but not dark. The second pair of eyes are the eyes of the mind, but these eyes do not grow on our body, but exist in our consciousness. Just like the levitation spell can only control things within the physical eye, we can feel our body because of the existence of the mind's eye. Like this, after saying that, Shane touched the hand of a little eagle next to him with his wand, and the whole body of the little eagle softened instantly. Can you feel yourself in your body? Shane squatted down and asked. No, I can't feel it. Xiaoying fell to the ground and pressed his face, answering vaguely. But he wasn't angry, instead his eyes started to light up because he seemed to understand what Shane wanted to say. Okay, get up. Shane patted Xiaoying on the shoulder to get his body back under control, and then continued. To use the levitation curse to fly, you must first learn the wandless casting of the levitation curse. After learning the wandless casting, you must put aside your previous understanding of this spell and no longer be limited to using the naked eye to help you cast spells. To be specific, after you learn how to cast spells without a wand, you need to learn how to use the levitating spell with your eyes closed and then remember the feeling of making things fly in the process, and then use this feeling as attached to itself. It's not easy, but if you are willing to spend enough time, you can do it. At this time, Shane raised his head and glanced at the lounge, and found that the entire Ravenclaw lounge was already full of people. There were many eaglets who joined in the middle of the class to listen to the class. Some of them had just returned from dinner, and some of them ran downstairs when they heard the sound of the lecture in the dormitory. 
Is there anyone else who doesn't understand? Shane asked. Shane, do you mean, let us remember the feeling when casting the levitation spell, and then use this feeling on ourselves? Penelo asked. Bingo. That's it. Shane nodded. Oh, the little eagles made a sound of sudden realization, and Shane's lesson was finished. After a while, Shane saw Xiaoying in the lounge one after another trying to practice wandless casting, and felt silently relieved. But he quickly realized why he felt like he had stolen Professor Flitwick's job. Shane shook his head. We can't stay in this lounge now. Why not go to the restricted book area? So, after making up his mind, Shane left the common room silently. The restricted area is an area in the Hogwarts library located on the fifth floor of Hogwarts Castle. The books in the restricted book area will be separated from other ordinary books by ropes. The books usually contain black magic or other content that is not suitable for young people or the general public. When senior students learn defense against the dark arts, might use the book here. If students want to enter the restricted book area, they can only borrow books after obtaining permission from the professor and presenting a note signed by the professor. But for Shane, it doesn't seem to make any difference whether it's permitted or not. Others were directly invisible and transparent, and passed directly through the rope used to divide the area. After looking around, I saw a few senior students walking around in the restricted book area, seemingly looking for the books they needed. The restricted area is complex and dangerous. In some ways, it is the most dangerous place in Hogwarts Castle. Because there are not only books related to black magic and poisonous spells, which may contain curses or magic, but also many unknown mechanisms and hidden areas. Shane inquired from the ghost that before Voldemort started to cause trouble, the conditions for entering the restricted book area were actually not that strict. At that time, all students above the fourth grade could enter and exit at will, while students below the fourth grade needed permission from the professor. But since Voldemort was seriously injured 10 years ago, perhaps Dumbledore was afraid that students with evil intentions would learn dangerous black magic, which would cause serious changes in their mentality, so he upgraded the access restrictions to the forbidden book area to the current level. At the same time, many books on black magic that were placed in the general area were also moved to the restricted book area. Therefore, this is why when Shane was in the library on the second floor, he could only find some insignificant books such as history of magic and biographies. After sneaking into the restricted book area, Shane wandered back and forth between the bookshelves. He was not interested in books that recorded black magic and poison spells, because he had dozens of destructive magics at his disposal and no need to waste time learning these magics. What Shane wanted to find at this time were books related to curses. The reason why he wanted to understand curses was that this power was too evil. In a sense, it was completely a causal weapon. In a slant, magic is either used in combat or in combat services. Almost all the points in its magic tree are on the strength branch, which is what makes Shane so powerful in combat. But in the world of Harry Potter, the magic tree here is biased towards the mysterious branch. Under the mysterious magic system, no matter how powerful Shane is, there is no guarantee that he will not overturn. The sky outside the library window has gradually turned from blue to pitch black, with thick clouds completely covering the crescent moon. At this time, the library has been closed for a long time and the lights have long been extinguished, but for a person who knows magic, reading in the dark is not difficult. Shane has been in the forbidden book area for several hours. It's almost midnight, but he is still studying, the power and principles of curses, with a copy. But at this moment, an extremely harsh sound of opening the door suddenly interrupted Shane's thoughts. Is this filch still patrolling the library so late? Shane looked in the direction of the source of the sound, but found that the person who came was not the administrator of his school, because he was not holding a lighting lamp, and he was walking towards the restricted book area in a sneaky way. Is this another little lion who came to the forbidden book area for adventure at night? Shane looked at the visitor curiously, but didn't want to pay attention and continued to read with his head down. But after a while, he suddenly heard a creepy sound. Shane was shocked and immediately felt something was wrong, because not only was it the sound, but he also smelled a disgusting smell of blood in the air. That little wizard seems to be in the forbidden book area. Without any hesitation, Shane dropped the book and went to save people. Following the sound, 
Shane came to the deepest part of the restricted book area. I saw the little wizard who was wandering at night standing stiffly in the darkness. In front of him was a hidden mechanism that had been opened. At his feet were glass bottle fragments on the ground. Veins popped up all over his body, and the whites of his eyes were completely gone, all replaced by darkness. At the same time, there were bursts of weird snake-like hissing sounds coming from his throat. What the hell? Shane was shocked when he saw this and quickly ran over to check the situation. When Shane ran to the little wizard, he felt an extremely strong fishy smell coming to his nose, making him nauseous. Classmate. Classmate. Ah. Shane quickly blocked his sense of smell with magic, grabbed the little wizard's arm and shook it tentatively. Wrong. Something is terribly wrong. The little wizard's arms felt like scales, and there was a chill that made one's heart palpitate. At the same time, the hissing sound coming from the little wizard's throat became even more harsh. Faced with such a weird scene in front of him, Shane didn't know what caused it, and he didn't know what method he should use to prevent the little wizard's condition from getting worse. No, since there is nothing we can do for the time being, seal him first. Immediately afterwards, Shane clapped his hands, and a huge golden magic circle covered the little wizard. The pattern of fairy wings in the center of the magic circle slowly rotated. Fairy glitter, activate. The dazzling golden light illuminated the entire fifth floor library and penetrated the corridors and windows. On the other side, Filch, who was patrolling the corridor at this time, was looking in shock at the sacred light that dispersed the darkness in the distance. After being stunned for a while, he quickly ran towards the fifth floor with the lamp in his hand. Fairy Glitter, one of the three super magics of the Fairy Tale Guild. It is an absolute defensive magic. It can create an invincible protection ball to protect all members and the environment in the ball, and also has the ability to freeze all time in the ball. Effect. The brilliance of Fairy Glitter slowly disappeared, leaving only a faint fairy wing mark on the little wizard's forehead. Seeing that the seal had been completed, Shane grabbed the little wizard and disappeared into the library without saying a word. On the other side, Filch had just reached the fifth floor, panting. In the Hogwarts principal's office, Dumbledore had not yet rested. He was still searching for clues in his past memories in the Pensieve. But just when Dumbledore was concentrating on recalling the past, suddenly, two figures appeared behind him, and one of them dragged the other and shouted, Professor Dumbledore. Oh. Oh my god. Dumbledore was suddenly startled, and even his whole body couldn't help but tremble. He turned around suddenly and saw Shane dragging a Gryffindor student standing behind him, and he was relieved. Mr. Dolea, how did you get in? Dumbledore's office has a defense mechanism, and no one can just enter it casually, except for recognized people. Put this kind of unimportant matter aside for now. Shane dragged the little wizard to Dumbledore, please see what's going on with him first. Huh, this is... Dumbledore put on his eyes, and his expression suddenly became extremely serious as soon as he saw the little wizard's condition. Fox, please go to Minerva and Severus and ask them to come here. Dumbledore said seriously to Phoenix Fox. As long as it can take the two professors to apparate in Hogwarts. Fox responded with a cry, spread his wings, and disappeared on the golden perch after a burst of golden flames. Wow, I didn't notice it last time I came here. Professor, your pet is a bit extravagant. Even if it's a phoenix, there's no need to use a golden perch. Shane put the little wizard on the sofa and went over to knock on Fox. Kiji said, this is at least 10 kilograms of gold, and I'm not afraid that Fox's flames will melt it. The flames of the phoenix cannot melt gold instantly, and this branch has always been one of the inheritances of the Dumbledore family. It is at least older than my grandma. Dumbledore said. After saying that, Dumbledore began to carefully observe the little wizard's situation, while on the other hand, Shane began to pick up Dumbledore's snacks. Mr. Doria, can you tell me how he became like this? Dumbledore asked after a while. Huh, how did I know that he has nothing to do with me? Shane held up a box of pink shimmering coconut sorbet and puffed up his cheeks and said, I was reading a book, and I didn't expect it. It happened that something happened to him, so I was just kind enough to lend a helping hand. Just as Shane finished speaking, a golden flame suddenly appeared in the middle of the office, and both Professor McGonagall and Snape appeared in the flame. 
Professor McGonagall was still wearing pajamas and a blanket draped over his shoulders. He must have been woken up from bed by Fox. Snape, on the other hand, had an angry and impatient expression, and he had staggered and tossed his hair just now. Shane guessed that Fox had brought him here without saying a word. Albus, it's so late. Professor McGonagall was just about to ask what was so urgent, when she saw the little wizard lying upright on the sofa, oh, my god. It's Mr. Kenneth Toller, in the end what happened? I think the big celebrity in our school must have done something. Snape looked at Shane with a sinister look and said, otherwise Mr. Dolea wouldn't have appeared here so late. Quote dot 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 quote. Shane stared with dead eyes, chewed snacks in his mouth, and didn't want to speak. As for Snape's vicious tongue, if you take it seriously, you will lose. The best way is to ignore it, leaving him with no way to draw on it, and suffocating him to death. Sure enough, Snape saw Shane ignoring him and his eyes twitched invisibly. Severus, please take a look at our student's condition, Dumbledore said. With a wave of one hand, Snape lifted the black robe behind him and walked to the student named Toller. He first opened Kenneth's mouth to look at it, and then pulled his clothes apart a little. Kenneth's tongue has become forked, and at least one-fifth of his skin has grown silvery scales. After a while, Snape finished the inspection and said to Dumbledore expressionlessly, Snake slave blood curse. As soon as he finished speaking these words, Professor McGonagall clutched his chest and looked at his students with horror and worry. Can it be cured? Dumbledore asked. Okay. Snape replied, this blood curse is not complete. Technically it looks very immature, like it was made by a novice. I'm just curious. His blood is needed to create a snake slave, but how did this come out now? And it seems that the snake transformation in this student was prevented by someone using a special method. So, can you give us an answer? Mr. Dolea who looks like a starving ghost. Click, click, click. The sound of chewing chocolate hazelnut kernels gave the three professors present a headache. Mr. Dolea, now is not the time for snacks, this is a matter of life and death for a student. Professor McGonagall said angrily to Shane. Don't worry, Professor McGonagall. Even if I die, this little lion will be fine in five years. Shane said while eating snacks, he was infected in the deepest part of the forbidden book area. He seems to have opened it. A hidden mechanism, and the contents inside were broken. Hey, this is it. With that said, Shane took out the glass shards that fell at Kenneth Toller's feet. The fragments were floating in midair, and under the illumination of the lights in the office, the red liquid remaining on them was extremely attractive. Snape took out the wand from the wand pouch on his waist and gently fiddled with a shard of glass stained with red liquid. He squinted his eyes and observed, then without hesitation used magic to cut one of his fingers and fuse a drop of blood with the liquid on the glass. After a while, Snape saw no response and said, it has failed. How much time do you need, Severus? Dumbledore looked at Snape. Some materials need to be collected through special channels. It will take me two weeks to prepare the antidote to the blood curse. Snape replied. Okay, Minerva, please explain this to this student's parents so that they don't have to worry. Okay, Albus. Professor McGonagall nodded. At this time, Shane, who had been standing aside, saw that Dumbledore had basically solved the problem, so he walked over and asked curiously, Professor, I know the blood curse, but what is the snake slave blood curse? What does it have to do with Voldemort? Quote. Mr. Dolea, this name cannot be spoken casually, and you need to explain why you left your dormitory during curfew and appeared in the restricted book area. Only then did Professor McGonagall think of settling a score with Shane, because this time Shane actually violated the school rules. She planned to take advantage of this opportunity to punish the naughty student in front of her. Professor McGonagall, I admit that I violated the school rules, but you also have to think about it from another perspective. If I hadn't been in the restricted book area tonight, no one would have known about this guy. Shane started to reason rationally again, and pointed to Kenneth Toller who was lying on the sofa. Minerva, it is indeed against school rules to be in the restricted book area during curfew time. But at the same time, Dolea did save her classmates and the fate of Mr. Toller's family. At this time, Dumbledore also spoke up. So, about this time for Mr. Dolea's violation of school rules, I think it would be fine to deduct 30 points from Ravenclaw as punishment. Albus, you can't. 
Professor McGonagall thinks this is completely conniving. For Shane, 30 points can be added back in two or three days. There is basically no big difference whether or not this punishment is given. Minerva, perhaps you have a more appropriate punishment. Dumbledore threw the question back to his old friend, leaving Professor McGonagall speechless for a moment. Because Dumbledore was right, although Shane did violate school rules, he also saved someone's life. The merits and demerits are equal, and you can't really fire Shane. So after thinking about it, Professor McGonagall really couldn't think of a more appropriate way to punish Shane for his violation. Thinking of this, Professor McGonagall sighed helplessly, then glanced at Shane and said, I'll send Mr. Toller to Poppy. Then, he used the levitation spell to pull Kenneth Toller to the school hospital. Watching Professor McGonagall go away, Shane held a snack can and asked Dumbledore the question he just asked. Professor, you haven't told me yet, what is this snake slave blood curse? Shane spent this time in and out of the forbidden book area, and he knew that the blood curse was an extremely vicious curse, and its history could be traced back to more than 1,200 years ago. The blood curse can make a person gradually lose his mind over time and turn into a beast. The power of the curse will even remain in the blood and be passed on to the next generation, making it extremely difficult to remove. To this day, the entire magical world has not heard of anyone who can propose a solution to the blood curse problem, or even a method to alleviate it. After hearing Shane's question, Dumbledore pondered for a while, and then began to say, the snake slave blood curse is an irreversible and vicious curse. Its biggest feature is that it turns people into a half-human, half-snake monster and obeys the snake. An order in a lame tone. Back then, he used this blood curse to control those who resisted him and played with human nature, so that many people were forced to kill their relatives or close friends. I still remember one of my students, who couldn't even hold his wand steady at that time, and was heartbreakingly facing his parents who had been controlled. But Mr. Toller is lucky. He is not under a complete blood curse. It should have been caused when he was a student. He can be cured with magic potion. It seems I have to study more, otherwise I won't know when I capsized in the gutter. After hearing Dumbledore's words, Shane murmured in a low voice. The power of the curse was really too weird, so he had to take precautions and have corresponding means. At the same time, Shane seemed to suddenly remember something, and asked Dumbledore, Professor, is it possible that Professor Quirrell did this? Because according to what was just said, if under Voldemort's instructions, Quirrell might have used magic to control Kenneth Toller to be infected with the blood curse, thus giving him an extra helper at Hogwarts. The way he looks now, he doesn't have that much courage. Dumbledore said confidently, what's more, the blood curse on Kenneth is incomplete. The snake slave transformed has a lot of snake characteristics, scales and forks, tongue, etc., cannot be hidden. Then I understand, but now that the matter has been dealt with, it's time for me to go back to the dormitory and sleep. Shane put down the empty snack can and was about to leave, but just when he was about to activate his magic, he suddenly remembered something. Oh, yes, there's more. Shane turned around and reminded, Professor, there is one thing I want to remind you. If Professor Snape has prepared the antidote, please tell me, and I will tell the classmate who prepared the antidote. Unlock the magic on your body, otherwise it will be of no use if you pour medicine into people. After saying that, he disappeared into the office in an instant, leaving Dumbledore alone with his thoughts. After seeing Shane disappear before his eyes, Dumbledore still didn't understand what kind of magic Shane had used to enter his office. Logically speaking, this is the center of the entire Hogwarts. It has no windows and is protected by powerful magic. There is no other way for ordinary people to enter except through the stone beasts outside. After sorting out the messy thoughts in his mind, Dumbledore decided to strengthen the office's protective magic. For no other reason than to prevent someone from breaking in and stealing snacks while he was away. You know, in just half an hour, his snacks were almost emptied. The next day, Saturday. Shane took a long nap and didn't get up until almost lunchtime. On his first weekend at Hogwarts, Shane was brushing his teeth and thinking about how to find something to do. He couldn't stay in the lounge and library reading all the time, or he would easily become a nerd. Therefore, Shane was thinking about how to find something more practical to occupy his leisure time. 
After thinking for a while, Shane suddenly remembered that last night, when he was touring around the old B office, he saw something very special. Gryffindor's sword is placed in a glass box next to the sorting hat. This reminded him of the plot of the second part of the Harry Potter movie. Slytherin left a secret room in Hogwarts, and the founders of the four major colleges also left their own inheritance. According to the conjecture of some senior Harry Potter fans, perhaps in addition to Slytherin, the other three founders may have left some of their own heritage to future generations at Hogwarts or somewhere. Ever since, thinking of this, Shane's mind immediately became active. As Ravenclaw's eaglet, he naturally set his first target on Rowena Ravenclaw's legacy. The first step is to find Ravenclaw's crown. Because in the original work, this is the only thing that is most likely to contain clues to Ravenclaw's inheritance. Shane still clearly remembers that Ravenclaw's diadem, as one of Voldemort's horcruxes, has been hidden in the Room of Requirement. It was a huge room full of debris, with various old items and even piles of it became a hill. But while Shane still remembers the location of Ravenclaw's diadem, he doesn't know the exact location of the Room of Requirement. Therefore, he planned to find the ghosts of Hogwarts. They had been in the castle for so long, and they must know where the Room of Requirement was. At least there will be some clues to guide you. You said the Room of Requirement, where is that place? I have never heard of such a place in Hogwarts for hundreds of years. It was Hufflepuff's ghost, the fat monk, who was speaking. She wears clothes with rumpled collars and tight pants, is short and fat, dressed like a monk, has the typical friendliness and compassion of Hufflepuff Academy, and is a cheerful ghost. Every year at the start of Hogwarts, the fat friar would try to convince the other ghosts to let Peeves attend the banquet, but he never succeeded. To be honest, Shane originally wanted to go find Helena Ravenclaw, but this beautiful lady has a really weird temper. Even as a hawk, he would be kicked away immediately if he wanted to talk to Helena for more than a few words. Walk. Therefore, he could only come to the fat monk who had the best temper and was willing to help others. After hearing the fat monk's denial, Shane remembered that the room of requirement was originally a secret place and never had a fixed name, so he changed his explanation and asked. Then do you have the impression that there is a place in Hogwarts where different people will go to different rooms when they open the door? Oh, when you mention it like that, I remember there is such a place. The fat monk thought for a while and said, on the eighth floor of the castle, opposite the tapestry where the troll beat Barnabas silly, I once saw a filch and I took the cleaning supplies there, and I originally thought it was a utility room, but then I saw Principal Dumbledore go in and it turned into a toilet. Yes, that should be there. Shane said excitedly, thank you, fat friar. If I have a chance, I will go to Diagon Alley and buy you some gifts. There are indeed items and food for ghosts sold in Diagon Alley, but that store is located at the entrance of Nocturne Alley, and few people go there. The last time Shane passed by the entrance of Nocturne Alley, he saw the signboard of, Ghost Life and Food, and then he learned that such a place existed. After determining the location of the Room of Requirement, Shane flew to the 8th floor without stopping. He stood in front of the tapestry of the troll beating Barnabas Silly, facing a bare wall, and began to mutter impatiently in his heart, I want to go to where the Ravenclaw's crown is. I chanted silently several times, but for some reason, the wall didn't respond at all after a while. This puzzled Shane. No, what went wrong? Are you looking in the wrong place? The Room of Requirement isn't here. And just as Shane was pacing back and forth thinking, a smooth door suddenly appeared on the wall. This made Shane a little puzzled because he didn't know which part had gone wrong and caused the door to not appear. But now is not the time to think so much. Shane ran over and pushed open the door of requirement and came to a huge utility room. Countless waste items, desks and chairs with broken legs, books with broken pages, crushed copperware, broken mirrors, torn curtains, as well as countless picture frames, bronze statues, glass jars and boxes, etc. Wait. These things were stacked on top of each other from large to small, forming mountains that could not be seen to the end. Wow, this is at least as big as a Quidditch pitch. How can I find a crown? Shane first marveled at how big the place in front of him was, and then started to have a headache how to find the thing he wanted among the piles of clutter. There are tens of thousands of large and small sundries in this room. If you just rely on people to find it, you don't know how much time it will take. So, 
How was the crown found in the original novel? Shane thought about it and suddenly recalled that Voldemort's Horcruxes seemed to be able to sense each other. Horcrux. Isn't there a living person in this school? Hogwarts Great Hall, because today is the weekend, many little wizards will choose to play some small games here to pass the boring time. But what is different from the past is that the weekend of the new semester seems to be a little strange. In the auditorium, the young wizards from the other three colleges were looking at the little eagles not far away. The question marks and exclamation marks above their heads had reached the sky. On the Gryffindor's long table, Ronald sat at a corner of the table and asked Harry opposite him in confusion. What happened to Ravenclaw's group of people today? I usually see them acting a little weird, but at least they are normal people. Why are they all so crazy today? I don't know, but they look like they are practicing wandless casting. Harry shook his head as he heard, Leviosa, coming from not far away. He didn't see anyone from Ravenclaw holding a wand. Isn't wandless casting something only senior students can learn? And it's not a required course. Why does Ravenclaw come to the auditorium to practice like this? I've found out clearly. Just when Harry and Ronald were confused, Hermione suddenly jumped out from the side, holding a huge book in her hand. I don't think you're any better than them. Ronald complained as he looked at the book. Ronald's words made Hermione give him a fierce look, and Ronald immediately turned his head in resignation. Hermione, what did you find out? Harry asked curiously. It's Shane. For some reason, there was a hint of resentment in Hermione's voice when she said the name. I just found out from someone else that yesterday afternoon, Shane taught everyone how to fly using the levitation spell in the Ravenclaw lounge yesterday afternoon. Now all Ravenclaw students are practicing this spell. Shane. Shane Dolia. Is that the weirdo who flies around the school every day? It was obvious that there was a hint of jealousy in Ronald's words. Shane is not a weirdo. Hermione glared at Ronald a little angrily. But compared to Ronald, Harry couldn't help but become very interested when he heard that he could fly using magic spells, so he asked Hermione. Hermione, have you ever found out how to learn the flying spell? No. Hermione shook her head dejectedly, I asked a few people and they were all unwilling to tell me. They said this was something Shane taught Ravenclaw and it cannot be passed on to anyone else. Oh, that's right. Harry's face froze when he heard that he couldn't learn how to fly. Then why did they come to the auditorium to practice magic? Isn't the common room in Ravenclaw enough for them? Ronald asked again at this time. It seems that Ravenclaw's lounge has been occupied by senior students. It's raining outside today, and the school rules stipulate that magic is not allowed in the corridors, so now all Ravenclaw students below the third grade come to the auditorium to practice magic. Hermione explained. And while the three of them were talking, the person who caused Ravenclaw's abnormal phenomenon was quietly attacking them. After Shane came out of the room of requirement, he randomly caught a lion cub on the road. After asking about it, he immediately came to the auditorium. As soon as he entered the door, he saw the goal of his trip. Shane came quietly behind Harry and Hermione, and Ronald, who was sitting opposite Harry, saw a figure suddenly appear from behind his friend, and suddenly screamed in fright. Ah, Ronald flew up from his chair. Harry and Hermione looked at Ronald in confusion, then followed his frightened gaze and looked behind them, only to see the person they had just been discussing standing behind them. Shane. Hermione yelled, a little excited in her tone. Hello. Shane rubbed Hermione's head vigorously. You messed up my hair. Hermione immediately slapped Shane's hand down angrily and punched Shane a few more times on the arm. Her hair was already long and thick, and it was naturally slightly curly, which was very difficult to take care of. When Shane did it, her hair became a mess. Go away, I don't want to care about you. Hermione fixed her hair while giving Shane a vicious look. Because Shane had no interaction with Harry or Ronald before, she subconsciously thought that Shane was here to find her. But she obviously guessed wrong. Shane tapped Hermione's head with the milky white wand in his hand, which instantly made her hair smooth. At the same time, he said, I'm not here for you, I'm here for him. With that, he patted Harry with his right hand with a smile, on the shoulders. Looking for me, Harry was confused and surprised. It's been less than a week since school started, and he hasn't even recognized all the Gryffindor classmates in the same grade, 
so he doesn't even remember having any interactions with the famous people in the school in front of him. I need your help with something, Shane said to Harry with a smile. Wah, what are you busy with? Harry was a little nervous. The living environment he grew up in made him a little introverted when facing strangers. Don't ask for specifics, just follow me. However, in return, I can teach you how to fly using the levitation spell. It was obvious that Shane heard the conversation between the three of them just now. Then, okay, I'll go. Hearing that he could learn flying magic, Harry hesitated and agreed. This may also be because Harry inherited his father's genes and was born with a unique yearning for flying. While watching the movie, Harry was exposed to flying broomsticks for the first time in flying class, but he was not afraid of heights at all. He was even allowed to join the Gryffindor Quidditch team as a first-year member by Professor McGonagall. There's no talent involved, Shane doesn't believe it. Seeing Harry agree, Shane immediately wanted to drag him to take off. But as soon as he started, Hermione grabbed his robe. Hermione, tell me what you have to say, but can you please stop grabbing my clothes when something happens? Sometimes I can't react and you will get hurt. Shane turned his head and looked at Hermione helplessly. Because the speed when I take off can be fast or slow. If someone drags me when I am fast, it is a trivial matter that the clothes are torn and can be repaired with magic. But that's not necessarily the case for the person who is dragging him. If he falls and dislocates his hand, it may be minor. If he falls from a height of several meters or even more than 10 meters, it is not impossible that he will be passed over directly. I'm going with you, and in exchange you have to teach me how to fly with the levitation charm. Hermione said, holding onto Shane's clothes tightly. Where are you going? I took Harry away to do business. Shane stretched out his hand and gave Hermione a slap in the face, if you want to learn, ask Harry to come back and teach you. After saying that, he dragged Harry and flew away without saying a word. Shane Dolia, just wait for me. Hermione covered her forehead angrily, don't ask me to teach you how to make potions in potions class in the future. He is from Ravenclaw, he doesn't seem to be with us much in class. At this time, Ronald reminded weakly from the side, but this made him roll his eyes again. On the other side, Shane took Harry to the eighth floor under the watchful eyes of many Hogwarts wizards. This is the room of requirement, a very secluded place in Hogwarts. Shane opened the door to the room of requirement and said, I brought you here because I want your help to find something here. Looking for something. Harry looked at the endless clutter in front of him, a little confused and confused, shouldn't we find more people to look for something? I'm only one person, and I don't know any magic. After hearing Harry's words, Shane smiled and reached out to pat Harry on the shoulder, only you can find this thing. Trust me, just follow your own intuition and find the thing that attracts you the most. Okay, okay, Harry replied, licking his lips nervously. Immediately afterwards, Harry wandered around among the many hills of debris. At first, he felt that Shane's words were a bit ridiculous, because it was a bit unreasonable to intuitively find something that attracted him among so many things without using magic. But for some reason, after walking for a while, Harry felt something calling him, and at the same time, he felt a burning and tingling sensation from the lightning scar on his forehead. So, following this inexplicable feeling, Harry walked around in circles for more than 10 minutes, and finally came to a round table covered with dust. I saw a copper star tracker and an unknown tower-shaped decoration placed on the round table. Between the star tracker and the tower-shaped decoration, a large ball of hemp rope was entangled with each other and placed on something. Harry stared blankly at the ball of hemp rope. He felt like there was something there that was constantly drawing him closer. At the same time, an inexplicable palpitation surged into his heart. The burning sensation on his forehead was extremely unbearable. And just when Harry was lost in thought, Shane suddenly appeared from beside Harry and pressed a cold ice pack on Harry's head. Found it, Shane asked. Harry, who was sobered by the ice pack, didn't say anything. He just looked at Shane and then nervously pointed in the direction of the hemp rope. Shane ran over randomly and excitedly and took off all the hemp ropes on the round table, revealing a square wooden box inside. Gently opened the box, and on the bronze velvet cloth, a sparkling crown set with gems is lying there. Shane carefully picked up the crown, put it in his hand and examined it carefully. 
he saw that the bottom edge of the crown was engraved with Ravenclaw's famous motto, Wisdom is the greatest wealth of mankind. Wit beyond measure is Mont's greatest treasure. There is no doubt that what Shane is looking for is what Shane wants to find, the sacred relic of Ravenclaw Academy, Rowena Ravenclaw's crown. What is this? Harry walked over and asked curiously. Perhaps because of the ice pack, or perhaps for other reasons, the burning sensation on his forehead had gradually faded. Crown. Shane replied vaguely, then slowly lowered the crown. Thank you, Harry. Shane tapped Harry's forehead with his finger, and a miniature yellow magic circle flashed past. This is the method of flying with the levitating spell, but whether you can learn it or not depends on you. After saying that, Shane activated space magic and sent the person away directly. On the other side, the Great Hall of Hogwarts. Because Harry was temporarily recruited by Shane, Ronald was playing with the wizard chess in front of him in boredom. But suddenly, from the corner of Ronald's eyes, he saw a dark shadow flash across from him. He quickly raised his head and saw that his friend was already sitting in front of him, with a confused look on his face. Harry. Ronald looked shocked. When did you come back? Just. Just. Harry still didn't react at this time. He looked around and found that he had returned to the auditorium, and then said, Shane didn't know what magic he used to pull me from the 8th floor. A room was sent back instantly. He can also use the magic of teleportation. Ronald looked incredulous, that's right. Shane Dolea, what did he come to see you for just now? He asked me to help find something. It's a crown with a big gem on it. Harry answered. Crown. Why is he looking for a crown, and why does he let you look for it? Ronald looked confused, he is so powerful in magic, can't he find a crown even if he looks for it? I don't know. Harry shook his head, but I know that I can find that the crown may be related to the scar on my head, or to Voldemort. Harry said. Shish, keep it down, Harry. Don't say that name so loudly. Sorry. Ronald looked around and found no one around, so he asked again, then why are you so sure that the crown is related to Fu? When I found the diadem, the scar on my forehead was very hot. I still remember when I was buying a wand in Diagon Alley, Mr. Ollivander told me that the scar on me was left by Voldemort. Harry whispered, said. This, is Shane Dolia related to Fu? Ronald said in horror. Harry shook his head. I feel like we should go find Hagrid. He should know something. Then what are you waiting for? Let's go. After saying that, Harry and Ronald immediately ran towards Hagrid's cabin in the heavy rain. Inside the room where you need everything. At this time, Shane was sitting on a huge wooden box, holding Ravenclaw's crown in his hand, studying it over and over again. But after a while, Shane discovered that there seemed to be nothing special about the crown in front of him except that it was beautiful. Even if he injected magic power into it, there was no reaction. Therefore, after researching for a period of time with no results, he simply put the crown directly on his head. According to legend, the crown has the function of increasing people's wisdom, and he wanted to verify whether it was true. As a result, Shane didn't feel anything when he first put on the crown. But after a while, he suddenly felt an inexplicable anger coming out of his heart, accompanied by many negative things. The hysteria when I just traveled to a slant, the first murder, the massacre in the face of the Dark Guild's inhumane behavior, the anger when I heard that all my companions on Tenro Island were missing, etc. All the negative emotions hidden deep in his heart are constantly flowing out and amplifying, affecting Shane's sanity. This bizarre situation caused Shane to immediately take the crown off his head. Voldemort, just wait. Shane was sure that the situation just now must have been caused by Voldemort's soul within the diadem. It now seems that if one does not know that the crown is a horcrux and has been with the horcrux for a long time, it is very likely that one will be affected by the horcrux and lose oneself and gradually become corrupted. There must be a way to destroy Voldemort's soul without damaging the crown. Shane recalled that in the original work, he seemed to remember that there were two ways to destroy horcruxes. One is the venom of the basilisk. The second is to use the fierce fire curse. The fire spell will definitely not work. Shane remembers that it is not an ordinary flame. It will most likely melt the crown directly. But if it's basilisk venom, Shane could go to the dungeons of Hogwarts right now, punch through the floor, and go to the chamber of secrets to find the basilisk. 
For such a big snake, the venom in the venom sack in its mouth can definitely soak the entire crown. But Shane doesn't dare to use this method yet because he doesn't know whether the basilisk's venom will also damage the crown. Unless he has no choice but to take risks, he will not take risks. Otherwise, if he damages the crown, he will be the one crying without tears. So, after much thought, Shane decided to put the crown away first and collect some information for the time being and do some research. However, Voldemort's soul just reminded him of many not-so-good things in the past. Shane feels that this account must be settled with Voldemort. Killing Quirrell directly was not enough, and he had promised Dumbledore not to interfere with Quirrell's matter. The flower grower couldn't break his promise. Therefore, Shane thought about it in his mind and came up with a good way, a way to kill Voldemort. At the same time, Harry and Ronald also arrived at Hagrid's small room, all wet. Hagrid lives in a small cabin on the edge of the Forbidden Forest. When Harry and Ronald came here, the first thing they saw was a huge stone bow hanging in front of the gate and a pair of rubber galoshes that looked like buckets. Harry took off his eyes, wiped the rain from his face, and then stepped forward and knocked on the door. Boom, boom, boom. The sound of collision between wood and knuckles was heard, and after a while, with a squeak, the door was opened a crack. Who? Hagrid's voice came from the door. Hagrid, it's me, Harry. Hagrid immediately put his head out of the door. He saw two wet children and immediately greeted them to let them in. Oh, oh my god, come in. Harry and Ronald ran tremblingly into the house. In Hagrid's cabin, he saw several smoky turkeys and pheasants hanging from the ceiling above his head. On the brazier in the corner, a copper kettle was boiling water, and the steam was beating against the lid of the pot rhythmically. On the other side of the room was a large bed with a clean quilt that was incompatible with the house. Take off your wet clothes quickly and come here to warm up the fire. Hagrid placed two low stools next to the stove. In this weather, do you have any important business coming to my place? It was autumn and winter in the UK, and the temperature outside was less than 20 degrees. Harry and Ronald were soaked in the rain, and the sudden drop in body temperature made them shivering. Hagrid, today I... While Harry was warming up the fire, he explained what Shane had just asked him for help. No, it's impossible. When Hagrid heard that Harry actually said that Shane might be related to Voldemort, Hagrid immediately shook his head subconsciously in denial, Shane can't be related to him, he's not that kind of person. Shane opened a vegetable patch next to the Forbidden Forest, not far from my place. He came to me at that time and asked me to help him take care of the things grown there. He also gave me a brand new quilt, which is the bed. That one. So, it is absolutely impossible for him to be related to Fu, impossible. But Hagrid, how do you explain why the scar on my forehead feels so uncomfortable when I'm close to that crown? That's something I've never felt before. Harry asked stubbornly. This. Harry's words indeed left Hagrid speechless. After a while, Hagrid sighed and said helplessly, Okay. I will go to Professor Dumbledore to talk about this matter, but before that, you have to promise me that what you just said will never be used again. Talk to anyone else. Do you understand? And you, the Weasley boy. With that said, Hagrid cast his serious eyes on Ronald again. Harry and Ronald looked at each other and nodded, got it. Well, I'll take you back first. I don't have any clothes for you to change here. I'll also go find Professor Dumbledore by the way. After saying that, Hagrid dug out a huge umbrella from the pile of debris in the corner of the room. Apart from him, this umbrella is more than enough to protect Harry and Ronald from the rain. After Hagrid sent Harry and Ronald back to Hogwarts Castle, he came to the stone beast downstairs in Dumbledore's office with an anxious mood. What's the password? Hagrid raised his head and thought for a moment, sizzling honey candy, buttery peanut candy, pear hard candy. After Hagrid tried more than a dozen passwords in a row, he finally shouted, Jelly Slug, and the stone beast was finally opened. Hagrid walked straight up the winding stairs and opened the oak door of the principal's office. He saw Dumbledore standing next to the golden perch feeding his phoenix. Hearing the sound of the door opening behind him, Dumbledore slowly turned around. Professor Dumbledore, good afternoon. Hagrid greeted first. Oh, hello, Hagrid. Would you like some jelly? Dumbledore said, pointing to the jelly slugs that were wriggling around on the table. 
They left crisscrossing trails of mucus filled with sugar on the copper plate. Oh, no, thank you. Hagrid declined politely. He didn't want to eat something so disgusting, even though it was actually a candy, but he thought crusty pie was better. It would be even more perfect if you add a little meat. This is what Shane taught Hagrid. Professor Dumbledore, it's like this, just now Harry. Hagrid reported to Dumbledore what Harry had just said to him. He looked exactly like Harry in the cabin just now. Dumbledore listened patiently to Hagrid's story, and the humor on his face suddenly disappeared, turning into an expressionless expression. Hagrid wouldn't lie, and the possibility of Harry making something up was very slim. So, if it's true what Harry said, what is Shane's purpose? What does the diadem he found have to do with Voldemort? While Dumbledore was deep in thought, the person who told him the answer quietly came. In the huge office, a figure suddenly appeared out of thin air, and a voice was heard that gave Dumbledore a headache. Professor Dumbledore, lend me your hat. Shane shouted. This not only made Dumbledore sigh violently and repeatedly, but also shocked Hagrid who was present. Huh, Hagrid, you're here too. Shane saw that the big guy he had just met a while ago was here, and said hello with a smile. Mr. Dolea, if you can, please go through the front door next time you come to my place. I, an old man, don't want you to scare me like this. Dumbledore said helplessly. Professor, you look down on yourself a little too much when you say this. If the white devil can be scared to death, you might as well make people believe that I am Chin Shuang. Shane joked, but we can talk about these things later. Professor, please lend me the sorting hat. Sorting hat, what are you looking for? Dumbledore was a little confused. Look for it to ask something. There is something I need to deal with. Shane took out the Ravenclaw's crown from his arms. I found this. The sorting hat must have known something after living for so long. This is Ravenclaw's diadem. Dumbledore took a closer look and instantly recognized what was in Shane's hand. A look of shock suddenly appeared on his face, where did you find it? Don't worry about this for now. This is one of Voldemort's horcruxes. I want to destroy the soul inside without damaging the crown. Horcrux. Voldemort. Dumbledore and Hagrid next to him exclaimed at the same time. Ahem. Dumbledore pretended to cough twice, and then said to Hagrid, Hagrid, you go back first, I already know what happened just now. Oh, okay, Professor Dumbledore. Hagrid touched his big belly awkwardly, then I won't disturb you, and I'll go back first. After that, he left the office with heavy steps. You're looking for Harry just for this crown. Seeing Hagrid leave, Dumbledore asked directly. Um, Shane tilted his head and didn't realize how Dumbledore knew for a moment, but when he remembered that Hagrid was here just now, he suddenly understood. Oh, we understand, that boy Harry went to find Hagrid, right? I have to say, Mr. Dolea, you do have Ravenclaw's wisdom beyond ordinary people. Dumbledore was not surprised that Shane guessed the cause of the matter, and confirmed Shane's guess with a disguised answer. Then, Mr. Dolea, can you answer this for me? Since you know that you asked Harry to help you find the Ravenclaw's crown, does that also prove that Harry is also one of his horcruxes? Is Harry also one of the horcruxes? Shane raised an eyebrow when he heard this question, Professor, you are asking this question knowingly. Although I don't know the specific situation back then, if you think about it carefully, you will know that no matter how many horcruxes Voldemort made that night, part of his soul will definitely be there that night in Godric Valley. After he was seriously injured by Harry's mother at the cost of his life, where do you think this part of his soul would be hidden? Could it be that someone cut the scar on Harry's forehead with a knife? What Shane said was correct. In fact, just when he said that Ravenclaw's crown was a horcrux, Dumbledore had already guessed that Harry was also one of the horcruxes. The reason why he asked this question was just to be more sure of what he was thinking. But this put him in an extremely difficult situation. If Harry is a horcrux, that means that in order for Voldemort to be completely destroyed, Harry must die. Could it be that this is the so-called prophecy of the Savior? To sacrifice a child and save the world at the cost of his life. Faced with this situation, even Dumbledore, who had gone through countless ups and downs, was at a loss to make a choice. Shane, who was standing aside, watched Dumbledore suddenly fall into silence, and couldn't help but call out twice, Professor. Professor. But received no response. 
So Shane shook his head and simply ignored Dumbledore. He walked straight to the shelf behind Dumbledore's desk and used magic to remove the sorting hat from it. Broken hat, wake up. Wake up. He pulled the sorting hat and shook it up and down a few times, shaking it awake. Stop, you annoying little wizard. The sorting hat, which had just woken up, twisted its brim and shouted, I should have sorted you into Azkaban then. Azkaban, you're just having fun, but in the end you're just a loser. You are the bad hat, and your whole family is a bad hat. My master in life was Godric Gryffindor, the most outstanding duelist of that era. The four founders of Hogwarts also injected their thoughts into me. I am the greatest hat in the world. I believe your last sentence. Your inexplicable confidence and arrogance are exactly the same as those of the little snakes in Slytherin now. I hate black-hearted people. What followed was a scolding battle between Shane and the sorting hat that lasted for several minutes. The kind that looks very childish to others. A few minutes later. Stop. Stop. Shane suddenly realized that he seemed to have forgotten his original purpose, so he immediately stopped and said, I almost forgot about the real thing, you should know this thing, right? You. Dot huh. The sorting hat wanted to curse again, but suddenly it saw the appearance of the crown, and immediately swallowed back the curse words it was about to say, and fell into silence. The tip of the hat pointed at the crown and moved up and down. It looked like a person was bowing, and the wrinkles on the hat's facial features became deeper. You know her, right? Shane said firmly when he saw the sorting hat's sudden silence, can you tell me about Rowena Ravenclaw, and whether she left anything behind in Hogwarts besides the crown? Or somewhere else? You brat, since the founding of Hogwarts, you are not the first person to want to find the legacy of the four founders. The sorting hat suddenly said seriously, but they all failed without exception. Only you, only you for thousands of years, appeared before me with a token I could not refuse, and asked the question of my inheritance. Am I the first? Shane was confused, then pointed to the glass box next to him, then what is this? I don't believe that no one has ever held this sword and asked questions about Gryffindor's legacy. At least I think the person standing there probably asked. As he spoke, he pointed at Dumbledore, who was still in a daze not far away. Gryffindors are special. Speaking of his master Gryffindor, the sorting hat paused, as if he didn't want to continue the topic. Kid, although you hold the token, I am just a reminder left by the four founders to future generations. How to find Rowena's legacy is up to you. The four houses and their founders maintain a strong and sincere friendship. They are like four stone pillars, firmly supporting Hogwarts. The teaching here is pleasant and harmonious, but the shortcomings and horrors of human nature are like devils. The sorting hat suddenly began to murmur and sing. The brave Gryffindor came from the barren marshes. The beautiful Ravenclaw came from the quiet riverside. The benevolent Hufflepuff came from the open valley. The shrewd Slytherin came from the mire. Go to the person who knows all the history of Hogwarts. He will guide you forward. Playing for fun, the sorting hat left its last words, and then suddenly returned to silence and returned to its original appearance of an ordinary hat. Shane carefully put the sorting hat back on the shelf and started thinking in his head. He most likely knows who the sorting hat mentioned just now is the person who knows all the history of Hogwarts. But compared to this, what Shane cares more about is the brief lyrics that the sorting hat inexplicably hummed in the middle. The first paragraph is meaningful, and the latter paragraph is the origin of the four founders. The most compelling thing to note is the phrase, strong and sincere friendship, in the previous lyrics. According to legend, Salazar Slytherin left Hogwarts because of disagreements with the other three founders, but now this simple lyric seems to have surfaced some truths that have long been lost in the long history. But Shane feels that the issue of lyrics can be put aside for the time being. Now that he has obtained important clues about the founder's legacy, he now wants to immediately find the person who knows all the history. So, Shane turned and looked at Dumbledore, wanting to say goodbye to him before leaving. But he never thought that in less than 10 minutes when Shane was talking to the sorting hat, Dumbledore had already recovered from his pensive look and was eating BB's multi-flavor beans as if nothing had happened. Oh my god, it smells like earwax. Dumbledore looked disgusted and threw the beans back into the plate. He raised his head and saw that Shane had finished chatting with the sorting hat, so he asked, Mr. Dolea, do you want to try it? Thank you, Professor Dumbledore, but I'm not hungry right now. 
Shane declined politely immediately. This old bee has good intentions and wants to harm me. Since the last time he ate the dung beetle flavored BB beans, he vowed never to touch them again. Oh, that's such a pity. Dumbledore's tone was full of regret, but soon he returned to his previous calm and composed appearance. Mr. Dolea, I will help you find a solution to the problem of Ravenclaw's crown, but I also really hope that if you can find it in advance, you can tell me the solution. Shane looked at the guilt that Dumbledore was trying to hide in his eyes, and he nodded, of course, Professor Dumbledore. Thank you. After coming out of the principal's office, it was already evening. Shane stood in the corridor and looked out at the sky. At a glance, there are mountains and ridges. The dark clouds in the sky have dispersed, and the golden sunlight shines through the remaining clouds, turning into flames that burn the entire sky. The black lake in the mountains has also turned into a lake mirror, with the water and sky reflecting in it, and Hogwarts Castle reflected in it, like a dreamy wonderland. Shane had not seen such a spectacular fire cloud for a long time, which made him stop and appreciate the rare beauty in front of him. Meanwhile, the Gryffindor House Common Room. This is where Gryffindor students usually study and rest. It is filled with soft armchairs, tables, and a bulletin board with school notices, various advertisements, posters, etc. The windows look out onto the school grounds and a large fireplace takes up an entire wall. At this time, the chain of suspicion extended again, and the two little lions seemed not to have listened to Hagrid's words at all. No, this is impossible, Hermione said decisively, you said that Shane is related to Voldemort. This is simply a fantasy. Hermione, please keep your voice down, we promised Hagrid not to tell others. Ronald said in a low voice. But you told me anyway. Hermione glared at him. Didn't Harry and I come to warn you because we saw you and Dolea getting close? Ronald said with a righteous look, we are doing this for your own good. What if you encounter any danger? I think it's even more dangerous for you to speculate on other people's appearance at will. What's more, why do you say that? Hermione asked angrily. Dolia, he's very suspicious. I'm sure that the crown he got in the room on the eighth floor is definitely related to Voldemort. Harry stuttered a little at first, but became more confident as he spoke. Dolea knows very well that I am the only one who can find that crown. Otherwise, it is just a simple matter of finding something. He can just find anyone. Or use magic. If the crown is okay, he doesn't need my help at all. Hermione was a little speechless after hearing Harry's words, because she didn't know how to refute Harry. However, she didn't believe what Harry and Ronald said from the bottom of her heart. For her, she subconsciously rejected the speculation that Shane was connected with Voldemort without even thinking about it. So, in order to help Shane prove his innocence, Hermione thought for a moment and asked, Harry, do you remember what that crown looks like? I can't remember exactly what it looked like, but I remember that the crown was very bright and set with a very large gemstone, and there were many small gemstones in the rest of the place. Harry recalled. Oh, by the way. I still remember that there was a line of words engraved on the crown, but I only saw two words and was sent back to the auditorium by Dolia. What two words? Hermione asked. Wisdom and wealth. Harry replied. Wisdom and wealth. Crown. Hermione wrote these words in the notebook she carried. But for some reason, the more she looked at it, the more she felt that the combination of these words looked very familiar, but she couldn't remember it for a while. After a while, Hermione couldn't find any useful information in her brain, so she simply slapped down the notebook, raised her little head, glanced at Harry and Ronald, and said, I'll go directly to Shane and ask for details. After saying that, he stood up and walked directly to the door of the lounge. Harry and Ronald looked at each other, shrugged helplessly and scratched their heads. They felt that they had said everything they should say. Hermione insisted on trusting Shane Dolea, and there was nothing they could do. Leaving the Gryffindor common room, Hermione headed straight for the stairs. It was dinner time, and she was almost certain that Shane was most likely devouring food in the auditorium at this time. However, Hermione miscalculated this time. She had just walked a few steps when she saw a familiar figure standing not far from the corridor, looking at the scenery outside intoxicatedly. Shane. Hermione yelled uncertainly. Shane, who was admiring the fire clouds, suddenly heard someone calling his name. 
He turned his head when he heard the sound, and saw that it was the little which he often teased. He then responded with a smile. Oh, Hermione, it's really you, what are you doing here? Hermione said as she trotted over on her calves. I just came out of Professor Dumbledore's office. I originally thought about going to eat, but I didn't expect to see the flaming clouds, so I just stood here and admired it. Shane said with a smile, what about you? What are you going to do again? Well, I am. Hermione was about to say that she came to see him, but for some reason, the words were stuck in her throat and she was unable to speak. I was. I also wanted to go to the Great Hall to finish the meal. Hermione stuttered for a while, and then came up with the most reasonable reason. Shane looked at Hermione who was hesitant to speak, and suddenly felt a little confused. Because it was obvious that she had something to say to him, but it seemed that for some unknown reason, Hermione was reluctant to speak. Then, Shane's eyes suddenly flashed with a blue halo, and he understood everything instantly. These two little brats are smart and arrogant at the same time. Believe deeply in your own assumptions, and even form a self-righteous truth about something in your mind without any evidence. This is human nature. People will automatically resist those things that deny them, regardless of the truth or not. However, regarding Harry and Ronald's suspicions, Shane did not want to get along with them. The wizards of fairy tale have always put their beliefs into practice, rather than trying to talk to others for a while. Only when knowledge and action are united can the greatest power of magic be unleashed. Shane didn't intend to expose Hermione, but when he saw Hermione's embarrassed look in front of him, he couldn't help but remember that a long time ago, Lizanna was like this, like a stray kitten, timidly approaching him, and then using it was impossible to hear her speaking at a volume that asked her about some magic practice issues. Recalling the past, Shane decided not to be too anxious to find the person who knew all the history of Hogwarts. Anyway, there was still a lot of time in the future. He reached out and touched Hermione's little head, and then said, follow me. Then, before Hermione could react, Shane had already taken her to the sky above Hogwarts castle in an instant. Hermione felt her eyes dazzled as she saw that there was nowhere to rely on under her feet. The sudden feeling of weightlessness filled her heart with fear. She quickly and subconsciously hugged Shane and let out a harsh scream. Ah. Ouch. Oh my god. Shane quickly covered his ears with one hand and covered Hermione's mouth with the other. Stop. Stop screaming. When Shane covered her mouth, Hermione immediately stopped screaming, but she was obviously frightened, her face was full of grievances, and there was even some moisture in the corners of her eyes. Seeing her pitiful look, Shane felt that he had bullied her too much, so he quickly slapped her. He took out the chocolate from his pocket in embarrassment, broke off a piece and stuffed it into Hermione's mouth. Ha ha ha, this is the chocolate I made myself. Try it, it's delicious. Shane smiled awkwardly. Hermione was originally very angry and aggrieved, but the rich sweetness of the chocolate and its silky texture instantly made her bad mood disappear. Seeing that the little witch's mood gradually calmed down, Shane slowly descended to the top of the castle tower. This is the highest point of Hogwarts castle, and under their feet is the astronomy classroom, where Professor Aurora Sinistra will let students learn about the movement of stars and planets in the night sky through telescopes. Finally calming down, Hermione looked at Shane resentfully, suddenly grabbed his hand and bit it. Ouch. Shane was caught off guard, and the stinging pain on his arm made him cry out. He quickly pressed Hermione's head with his other hand and asked loudly, Hermione, are you a puppy? Hermione shook Shane's arm hard, wiped her mouth, and said in relief, I let you bully me. Hey. Shane's face twitched, but he was helpless. I thought about it, forget it. I don't have the same experience as this little girl. Hermione looked around and found that she was standing on the top of the Hogwarts Tower, bathed in the golden sunlight. She asked curiously, where is this place? Why did you bring me here? The top of the astronomy tower has such a beautiful view. Come here for dinner. With that said, Shane took out two more pieces of chicken drumstick sandwiches and two pieces of black forest chocolate cake, and gave half of each to Hermione. But Hermione didn't dare to answer it at all, because she had gradually realized it now, and the human physiological fear of heights made her tightly grasp the spire next to her to stop her trembling body. Seeing her look like this, Shane couldn't help but roll his eyes and stamp his feet. 
An earth-colored magic circle flashed past, and then a stone platform extended from under their feet. What magic is this? Hermione asked in surprise. Eat, there are so many words. Shane handed the sandwich and cake to Hermione, and then began to complain, now I really regret bringing you up here. I originally thought that we could chat with each other while eating, so it wouldn't be so, boring. I didn't expect you to yell as soon as you came up and almost deafened me. It's not your fault. It's just because you didn't say hello in advance that you scared me. Hermione glared at Shane unwilling to be outdone. But soon, as Hermione bit into a piece of sandwich, the perfect combination of bread plus chicken thigh plus salad dressing plus cheese made her eyes suddenly turn into a pair of crescents. The sun slowly began to set, the fire clouds gradually faded away, and the sky put on blue clothes and began to show its mysterious side. Putting the last bite of cake into her mouth, Hermione licked her lips and looked up. She saw countless stars looming in the dark night clouds, and she suddenly felt pity in her heart. What a pity. If it wasn't so cloudy, we could see the stars. Hermione's eyes flashed with memories. A long time ago, I went to my grandparents' house. They had a big farm there. I remember my mother carrying me on a roll of wheat straw, and that was the first time I realized that the sky could be so beautiful besides just being blue. But I don't know why. After returning home to London, I have never been able to see the same beautiful starry sky. At this time, Shane was half lying on the stone slab, feeling the slight coolness under his body, and also feeling the breeze that was constantly blowing in front of him, carrying the fragrance of rain and vegetation. He listened to Hermione's words that seemed like she was making a wish, and looked behind the distant mountain tops, where the last traces of the sun were gradually being swallowed up by the night. Shane suddenly asked, Do you want to see it? What? Hermione turned her head and looked at Shane with confusion. I said, do you want to see the starry sky above your head? Shane asked again. Sure, but they're covered. If you want to see it, just tell me earlier. Why are you saying so many disgusting things? Shane slowly stood up from the stone slab, took out his wand from his waist, and pointed it at the sky. Seeing him like this, Hermione suddenly looked in disbelief and said, Shane, stop joking, no matter what the magic is. But before Hermione could finish her words, she saw a scene that she would never forget. In front of Shane's milky white wand, a sky-blue magic circle unfolded rapidly from small to large, with gorgeous and complex lines engraved in it that gave off a brilliant shimmer. Under the pull of the power of the magic circle, the surrounding air is rapidly shrinking towards the center of the magic circle, and a harsh buzzing sound is heard, accompanied by strong winds. Hermione was so blown away that she couldn't even open her eyes. The dragon killing magic of the sky, the roar of the heavenly dragon roar of the heavenly dragon. As Shane finished speaking, the power of the magic circle was released, and a stream of air compressed to the extreme rushed into the sky in an instant and tore the air apart. After a while, Hermione saw countless remaining clouds in the night sky above her head being dispersed by a huge force, and the stars in the sky suddenly showed their full appearance. And through the light of the stars, Hermione even vaguely saw a shock wave spreading in the sky, and then a dull explosion sounded. Boom. The little wizards at Hogwarts all thought it was thundering outside. Okay, let's see. Shane put away his wand as if nothing was wrong, then took out another piece of cake and ate it. Hermione stared at this in shock, as it was completely beyond her comprehension. She couldn't even imagine how much power it would take to blow away all the clouds in the sky above her head. She looked at Shane blankly, unable to speak. When Shane saw Hermione's stupid look, he suddenly laughed in his heart, but he still pretended to be confused and said to Hermione, why are you looking at me? Look at the stars. How did you do that? Hermione asked blankly. Just disperse the clouds, how else can we do it? What a joke. Hermione shouted like crazy, pointing at the sparkling starry sky, how can such magic exist? Then what did you just see? Shane asked with a smile. I, Hermione was speechless. Okay, I won't tease you anymore. Shane reached out and touched Hermione's head like a kitten. I just heard you said you wanted to see the stars, so I wanted to help you realize this little wish, so I must please keep it a secret for me. This time, Hermione never slapped Shane's hand away. Instead, she pulled the hand that was rubbing her head in front of her and asked, Can you teach me? No, Shane refused decisively. Ha. Huh. Ah, 
Shane felt a familiar tingling sensation coming from his hand, as if he had been bitten again. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and support my channel.